in a normal lecture, I would have flipped this slide to show you the map for the Mithridatic Wars. Alas, I can only record one narration per slide. So just like, remember that thing about Mithridates? This is what that map looked like. So at the beginning of Marius v. Sulla, the Mithridatic Alliance was a serious threat to Rome. I mean, look at this. Everything that's in orange here has sided against Rome with Mithridates. You may recognize some of it. Some of it Rome's already conquered. Yes, there's Macedon, there's Epirus, there's Thrace. Uh, you know, Rome had already destroyed Corinth. So Mithridates posed a significant challenge to Roman authority here. And the fact that Romans had to stop to have a civil war to deal with this shit? That's not normal. That's not good. That's really all I have to say about this. Um, I hope it is useful to some of you. Ah, uh, yes. Now we need to have a talk about political parties, such as they were in the Roman Republic. We have to be cautious because political parties don't mean the same thing in different modern governments, let alone in ancient governments. So these aren't parties with official membership or caucuses or conventions. These are more broad terms for the poles of shifting alliances and philosophies towards gaining and wielding power in the late Republic. And this is between the party of the Optimates, which you may recall this word from the Temple of Jupiter Optimus Maximus on the Capitoline Hill. These are the Optimati people, the best people, and I'll give you a minute to guess who best people are and how much money they have. Yeah, what you're thinking is probably correct. So this is the best people, the good Romans. The kind of Romans we like to have around here, not the, the new Romans with their new Roman money and those funky people from Italian countrysides. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so that's that. These are people who oppose land redistribution because they own it, <laughs> so they don't want to give up their land. Uh, they oppose anything that alleviates poverty in the city. They uh, are really into property owner rights. They're not interested in passing protective legislation for consumers, for renters, for um, soldiers. Boomers. Oh. <clears throat> not all boomers. Sorry. <clears throat> uh huh. Sulla was one of these optimates. Now, one of the ways that I'd like to think about optimates versus populares is with uh, the SPQR logo that Rome used for itself and puts on everything. This is a little bit like uh, Rome's version of USA. So the S is for Senatus, the Senate, and the P is the Populus. So the optimates are all about the Senate. And the Senate is all about hereditary power from a group of carefully curated elite families who can be added to slowly over time. So there's like a little illusion of upward mobility, but we're still keeping things very um, conservatively structured there. Uh, the populares are all about policies that benefit and engage the needs and the motivation of the majority. And keep in mind, as we've talked about earlier, uh, most people in Rome aren't senators, but most people in Rome have very few votes on their own. And a lot of them do have feelings that uh, align really closely with 
senatorial aspirations. And we, we see this dynamic around us all the time. Um, people don't necessarily pick a political party based on how it benefits them directly. Things like uh, religion and custom and uh, aesthetic preference even, uh, you know, family dynamics, family networks, as I think we're all very aware, yeah, how our family thinks about politics makes it, uh, makes our own position in that universe complicated. I'm saying all of this because it is easy, and some people do in a facile way, treat Popolare's politics as a kind of good guys versus bad guys thing. Um, you get it the other way around too. Um, Cicero fanboys are not fans of Popolare's. I, I really... Nobody gets a cookie in the late Republic, folks. Nobody. Maybe Vercingetorix. <clears throat> At any rate, Gaius Marius was uh, not the first Popularis. Yeah, we saw Tiberius Gracchus, uh, Gaius Gracchus did similar things. Gaius Marius, however, married that um, relief aid package legislation with uh, strong military credibility and also strong military backing. Tiberius Gracchus was a war hero, but Gaius Marius was something else. He was the general and the patron. Nobody was going to mess with him. But also, he had a bunch of troops that he'd made promises to. He had to keep those promises. And interestingly, it's exactly that same dynamic that controls what Sulla ends up doing when Sulla takes over. A lot of the people who die under Sulla died because Sulla's men were promised farmland. And for generations after that, these same Romans who were willing to kill other Romans to get farmland were people's neighbors, their colleagues. And if you think that might be awkward, yeah, it was awkward. That Catiline thing, that happens when one of Sulla's ex-soldiers named Manlius musters the citizen army that somehow Catiline gets involved with. All of which is to say, this creates a di divisive mess that's going to snowball into something that uh, is both non-functional but also very good at creating an empire. <coughs> and that's the the weird uh, head exploding thing about the late Republic is how, but something I also want to push back at at the outset because we're raised in a world that now is 2000 years into automatically thinking that Rome was at its best when it was at its biggest. And that a culture's success is measured in the size and extent of its influence. That is one way to measure a culture or to look at a culture, but it's hardly the only one. And it's kind of a, a limited one, isn't it? Because it doesn't tell us how many people are healthy, how many people are safe how many people have what they need to eat every day. I, know, I, I keep thinking to Yoda, if you'll pardon me, the, uh, the idea that wars don't make one great. That same thing applies to Rome. I don't think that being Roman at this time necessarily resulted in a great deal of happiness. And that's important, yeah? That's a really important thing to keep in mind because we chase bigness and greatness and power without stopping to question it and stopping to reprioritize. Now more than ever, I think that's uh, 
something that should be on our minds and hearts. Okay, back to the ever-increasing dysfunction of uh, first century Rome. And this brings us to Lucky Sulla. Uh, Lucius Cornelius Sulla Felix is this guy's full name. Cornelius is his... Um, Nomen, his family name, and it may sound familiar to you guys through its feminine form, Cornelia. Um, I'll give you a few minutes to remember this re reference. If not, this is Tiberius Gracchus's mom, was Cornelia. This is that family. Uh, now, this family had fallen onto hard times, so even though Sulla is from one of these old, old patrician families, he has to work his way up through the army. But when he comes to power in 81, the decisions that he makes have a lot to do with this um, reaction against what he perceives as Marius's attacks on the hereditary nobility of Rome. And a lot of the legislation he puts through is meant to dismantle the measures that began to be initiated under Tiberius and Gaius Gracchus and were eventually fulfilled under Marius. He repeals a lot of extended citizen rights from Italian allies. He um, gives property back to people from certain families. He gives property to his own soldiers. And then anyone who stands against him gets put, as I mentioned earlier, on the prescription list and then summarily beheaded. Uh, we're looking here at some modern fan art, modern 1700s is modern. Uh, you'll have to forgive me, I'm an ancient historian. Uh, the coin, however, was minted under Sulla's dictatorship, and that's roughly contemporary. Now, again, we have to be careful. It seems trendy these days to take portraits from the ancient world to slap some color on them, put them through Photoshop and be like, aha, yes, this is the actual face of. And some of them look kind of like creepy and improbable. Now, Nero might actually be creepy, but this is a questionable enterprise because when you put your face on coinage, in a time before photography, there's no way to um, verify that face. And a lot of the choices that we interpret as naturalism and realism, uh, art historians argue convincingly enough for me, were done to make a person look a certain way. Um, the largeness of the nose, for instance, and the strength of the profile uh, is meant to exaggerate features that were associated with the exercise of paternal power. Um, the pointy chin kind of jutting out also seems to be a bit of a feature of what people wanted in a leader face. And if you think for a minute about this, leaders still do this with their images. Yeah, they wear a certain suit or a certain uniform. Uh, they have particular hairstyle strategies that are meant to project images of youth and power and virility and, well, orangeness. This is something that's been going on for a really long time. And so, that may be kind of what Sulla actually looked like, but it's irrecoverable. And of course, neither of these two portrait busts, the, the sculpted portrait is also uh, identified as Sulla, and it is probably an attempt to portray Sulla. Uh, coins didn't have this, but busts did. All of the marble you see from antiquity used to have paint on it, from the buildings to the artwork. Um, we still have some bits of sculpture with the paint left on, but in the 17, 18, 1900s, it was fashionable to wash the paint off because modern viewers and museums expected to see this nice shiny white marble. So we are now seeing Sulla uh, in his best form stripped of his makeup, but the traces of paint left to us seem to show, um, at least on the base layer, uh, the shading is completely gone, so we're just getting the lowest coat of paint. Um, so imagine this is uh, browner and shaggier. 
if some of these were made so that the hairstyles could be swapped out, and I have some suspicions about this bust, although I don't have good information about this, uh, a little bit like Lego hair, and this was meant to allow you to update your ancestors' busts so that their hairstyle was always in fashion, which is a uh, another reason to be suspicious when you see artists' reconstruction of what ancient people really looked like. On the other hand, I love them. I can't get enough of them. They're my favorite kind of blog post because they're just super interesting. Though the last one I saw, somebody tried to Photoshop Julius Caesar and he looks like a vampire, like so pale. It's really quite inexplicable. Back to Sulla. What you need to know about Sulla is that he didn't invent military dictatorships. He didn't invent military coups. He's not the first person to hijack Rome's political system for his own gain. Bits and pieces of this have been happening for centuries. But by combining all of this with military power and military domination of the political machinery, and not just domination, like it's not that he marched into Rome and took over Rome with his military, but he used that military oppressiveness to cause the Senate to declare certain people illegal. What's scary about Sulla and what really rattles this generation and later results in the rise of Caesar and Augustus is that it reveals just how fragile the Republic really is. The um, psychological refuge, uh, part of why we who live in republics commit to live in that republic, is that we think of majority votes as something that is able to counter the power of a scary few. But that protection is only as strong as the conviction of the people who are willing to stick by it. And if someone's holding a weapon to the neck of political machinery, you can effectively make one vote count for a whole lot if you're the person holding that sword, which is what happens with Sulla. He's the guy with the sword, and the Senate is incentivized either to join him, benefit, and prosper, or uh, the only alternative to this is to openly defy this political overreach. And if you openly defy, you die. And this is how democracy dies, folks, is when it's no longer safe to stand up and say, hell no, when you can lose your life because of this, either because your opponent's supporters will hunt you and your family down and threaten you, or because the executive power in your area is willing to um, murder you in order to have their way. That's the beginning of the end. And that's one of the things that we should be worried about and should be vigilant about. So if you need a, a line, a place to go to the barricades on, this is it, on people's right to say shenanigans. Hopefully people will use that right for good. Yeah. So yes, here's what Sulla accomplishes during his six months as dictator. He himself uses this language and that's why it's in scare quotes. Uh, he called this a restoration of the Senate and of the Cursus Honorum. By restoration, this means stripping away a lot of the points of access to power for people who aren't patrician or aren't wealthy. This uh, created substantial property qualifications for a lot of high political offices and restricted the kinds of Italian allies who could have access to that power. Uh, thereby rolling back everything that had been won by the Italian allies in the social wars, at least not everything, but a lot. This also removed a lot of protections for people in um, below the poverty line conditions, uh, but also in middle class is a little bit of an overreach. But for 
uh, comfortably wealthy freeborn citizens. This meant a substantial reduction to their voting rights, and uh, there were also some military repercussions here. He made the Tribune of the Plebs a dead-end position. So you may remember the Tribune of the Plebs is kind of the alternative entryway to the ladder of the cursus norum. Sulla lops that off. The tribune can only be the tribune and then has to go away. He also removed the tribune's right to propose legislation. Effectively, the only power he left the tribune with was the power to veto. Now, this does not last. This one reverts back within a decade and it doesn't... Uh, it doesn't really stick. That is going to have repercussions after the midterm. So just keep this in mind. I think it's one of the good news items here, though, sort of, is that uh, he can't make the Tribune thing stick. It had been around too long. It was uh, too hallowed of um, an institution. And by now, Plebeian families were just as wealthy, if not wealthier, than patrician families, and that gave them an entryway into power. That's nice. Uh, next up, the confiscated land from all of the people that Sulla had just ordered murdered goes to his veterans. And as I mentioned in, on the first slide, I'm not going to belabor this uh, again. But this means that the Italian countryside was now seeded with these enclaves of Sulla's veterans. Should you ever yourself become a military dictator, please don't. But if you gotta, keep this in mind as a pro tip. What this meant is that after Sulla's death, these little um, enclaves of pro-Sulla loyal, loyalist sentiment were studied, studded all over the Italian countryside, which meant that whenever this political division between populares and optimates flares up again, you have these people willing to take up arms. It's partly what happens in the Catiline incident under Cicero. It's not just Sulla's veterans who have Italian land, Marius's do too, but Sulla's have a lot more because this is one of the first things he makes sure happens. He pays his army. And with that, he gets a huge amount of political capital. This is something that makes him so very dangerous and so very successful after he's dead. So if that's your goal, um, I hope you use this information for good. Oh dear. The next thing that he outlaws, and this does not stick, is the grain dole, the grain distribution. One of the interesting cool things about Rome during this period is that after Tiberius and Gaius Gracchus, one of the reforms that took was that Rome began distributing an amount of grain to every citizen head of household. So they, in effect, had an early version of the welfare state. And this ensured that for staple food supply, that all citizens were getting fed a certain amount. Uh, this is partly what supplies the bakers in the city of Rome, and this created a system of measures to ensure that the bread you were buying was made out of actual grain, like there are stamps involved. Uh, now, this is not anywhere near the level of regulatory control, say, the FDA has, but this is a problem that Romans encounter and solve earlier than you might think about it. And this is something that we're now seeing is really important, yeah. Uh, in order to guarantee stability and to ensure the survival of the state, sometimes, sometimes, you have to be willing to make sure that your vulnerable citizens don't die. And you make sure people don't die by feeding them. It's not a coincidence that in the, the century leading up to the development of the grain dole, there's also an attempt to provide uh, some sort of state-sponsored health care, at least to attract doctors into the city of Rome, with some uneven results that if you're interested in, I teach an ancient medicine class, um, which will be online in the summer, and I'm still figuring out how that's going to work. But if you're super interested, I think there's still room in that class, and it counts for GEP credits. So 
there's more that I'm not going to tell you right now. Uh, this Sulla puts a kibosh on, and this is another thing where the kibosh doesn't last. Almost immediately, this becomes impractical, because when you stop feeding Roman citizens and they begin to starve to death, and also there isn't a system in place to pay for the massive amounts of grain the city of Rome now needs to function, uh, Rome had by now long outstripped the ability of Italian surplus crops to feed the city of Rome. It needed to ship it in first from North Africa. Carthage was a major breadbasket in this period. And this is also why they're leaning on Egypt for the grain. Um, grain in the ancient Mediterranean is a lot like oil is today. Um, oil, natural gas, it's fuel. And without it, the Roman state rapidly begun, begins to spin out of control. So Sulla tries to stop it, but he can't. Next bit, uh, he redistributes citizen voters into 35 tribes, effectively diluting the popular vote still further from where it was already diluted. So this makes the voters uh, much less enfranchised unless they happen to be senatorial and patrician class, in which case their power remains and is uh, enhanced a bit. Um, this stuck around a little bit, but most of this legislative agenda, most of it was repealed shortly after Sulla's death. However, just because some harmful and destructive legislation is repealed, damage has already been done. A bell once rung can't be unrung. And this is something that people start to worry about. After Sulla, they know that their rights can go away. And they become very, very concerned and even more invested in backing politicians that they feel will keep this from ever happening to them again. So if you are a prospective military dictator, I want to point this out to you too, that just because it's you doing it now and it's convenient for you doesn't mean that somebody else can't use it against you. And it also doesn't mean that there aren't going to be unintended consequences. If not everybody is winning in your society, the people who aren't winning are going to find somebody who's going to speak for them. And you've got to take that into account, because the more creative you get, the less creative your opposition has to be. Quite frankly, I recommend not being a military dictator. I don't think it would be fun. It seems very stressful. But I guess, you know, if, if that's what you're into, I hope you're a, an awesome military dictator. Make me proud? I don't know. Next slide. Ah, yes. It's now time to introduce you to the first two members of the first triumvirate. Uh, this is that three-man political alliance I was mentioning in the overview slide. This consists of two older politicians and one younger politician. The one younger politician, spoilers, it's Julius Caesar, is where we're going with this. Um, excuse me for a minute, little man's crying. Okay, where were we? Yes, let me introduce you to Marcus Licinius Crassus. Oh, he is fun. Marcus Crassus is... Uh, from a wealthy family, but he himself didn't rest on his laurels. He was a very entrepreneurial kind of uh, robber baron. His name, by the way, Crassus means uh, thick, hefty. Uh, according to Pliny the Elder, his grandfather was famous for never, ever smiling ever in his life. Uh, his nickname was the uh, Agilastos, which means... Um, unlaughing, never laughing. Imagine him as this, um, uh... no, 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 don't, don't, okay, fine. Um, drat, 
uh, a bit of a Tywin Lannister sort of character. Uh, Crassus himself has some Tywin features of his own. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with Game of Thrones, don't worry, that's not necessary to understanding this guy, because I'm going to tell you all about this. And he first made his excess fortune during the prescriptions of Sulla. So he was one of the uh, chief headhunters during this period. It's uh, his formative entry into the political sphere, and he continued to act as one of Sulla's henchmen rising through the political ranks. Uh, but he didn't stop there. Uh, Crassus wasn't the sort of guy to um, uncreatively follow other people's sadistic plans. He invented the concept of the fire department, which I have in quotation marks because this isn't your local volunteer fire fighter department. Rather, what he meant by fire department is he'd show up at your house on some nice posh urban real estate and he would make you an offer that if you paid him a certain amount of money, say weekly, monthly, then he'd get some people to watch your house to make sure it didn't catch on far. And if it did catch on far, he'd put it out. Now, if you didn't sign up for Uncle Crassus's fire department, then you could expect your house to tragically catch on fire and burn down. But oh, Crassus was still willing to throw you a bone because he'd show up while your house was on fire and he would offer you, you know, okay, it's a real shame. I see your house is caught on fire. If only you'd listen to me. But you know what? I'm a patriotic Roman. Here's what I'll do. I will offer you, and then he'll quote you like a fraction of what your land is worth, let alone the house standing on that land. And he'll offer to buy your house. And if you don't take that offer, nobody else is going to try to buy that land. Yeah. Uh, if you haven't made this connection yet, I'm going to be real explicit. Uh, this is a mafia classic. <laughs> this is perhaps one of the oldest ones in the book <laughs> is the uh, fire protection racket old because it's super successful. Um, having your house burned down is... Oh my gosh! No, darn it, I've recorded too much of the slide. We have to keep going. Sorry. Um, Mr. Baby, where is your father? <clears throat> right. You're going to sit here and you're going to help me. So after Crassus had bought the land that your house used to be on at a tiny fraction of what it was worth, he would then build a slum on top of it. And then he would rent that slum out to low cost housing. And this meant that everybody who lives in the house, remember one of the ways you get to be a patron is you're a landlord. So imagine your landlord for a minute and then imagine yeah. your landlord is Crassus. And like every time there's an election, he makes sure that you vote for him or you get kicked out of your house. Uh, that's the kind of situation we're in. <laughs> but apparently he was, no, 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 little man, no. He was a really, really bad landlord. He didn't keep his properties up. They had a tendency to burn down, ironically. But nonetheless, Crassus took all of his earnings from the uh, decapitation incidents of 81 BCE and made a profit. Yes, that is very wrong, isn't it? Okay, good. Good, good, good. Go, go play with daddy. <clears throat> and please don't grow up to be like Crassus. <laughs> so the next thing he did was take control of the supply end of this grain supply. <laughs> the thing I was mentioning earlier as a good thing, and I do think it is a good thing to feed the vulnerable and the hungry, but if you are selling the state a lot of the grain that it is then supplying to your citizens, uh, not only are you making money off the state, but you can make it the Crassus Memorial Grain Supply, and thus win yourself a lot of votes. So that's creative. Now, on to some more sketchiness. Uh, this is the 
less easy to prove, but still interesting to know stuff. He was involved in a scandal earlier in his career where he was accused of raping a Vestal Virgin named Licinia. You may notice something a little familiar with Licinia's name. Do you see it? Yeah, she's related to Crassus, so it's not just like sex with a Vestal Virgin, it's non-consensual incest sex with a Vestal Virgin. That is, he, he's a rapist, an incest rapist. Now, this could have been made up by his considerable panoply of enemies. So if we want to be super generous to Crassus, and as a historian, I kind of have to be, this may not be true. I hope it is not for Licinia's sake. Uh, Crassus is acquitted of this, and that's great. Nobody gets buried alive, but maybe he did it. And the fact that a lot of Romans thought that this was super believable is telling, is telling. Now, how then and why do people keep voting for him, you may ask? Well, politics is just full of shitty human beings who get away with stuff, but also he was very clever about how he spent his money to get political capital, not just with the grain supply and the landlord racket, but he also bankrolled other politicians and then effectively owned their help. One of the many politicians he did this with was a young man named Julius Caesar, Gaius Julius Caesar, uh, Marius's nephew, who didn't have any money left over because remember that was Sulla's compromise is he let Caesar live but he took all of his family money. So when Caesar ran for political office he needed money to campaign to allegedly buy votes to do what you do to get super popular. So he borrowed it from Crassus at a massive interest rate and Crassus thought that he now owned Julius Caesar. So if Crassus sounds like a horrible human being and you're waiting for his comeuppance, maybe that will help you to feel a little bit better about him existing. But if not, the next thing I'm about to tell you sure will make you feel better. Because in 53 BCE, Crassus was sent as a governor to a province on the border of Parthia. This is an ancient empire that included um, Iran, Iraq, a little bit of what's now Turkey, um, essentially like the Tigris Euphrates River Valley on back into um, the mountains backing up onto the Hindu Kush in Afghanistan. Crassus then proceeded to start a war with Parthia that he then lost, not just lost, but his entire army was surrounded, captured, and according to some historians, was sent off to the other side of the Parthian border, um, which, as I mentioned, is on the end of the, the Hindu Kush near the Khyber Pass. And there is a Chinese legend that they ended up being sent as guards to this remote outpost on the very edge of what later became Chinese territory. Um, at the then emerging Silk Road. There's a Jackie Chan movie about this. It's uh, ludicrous. It gets nothing right, especially Crassus, but I'm very, very fond of it anyway. So if you're looking for something to do that's vaguely like studying, it's called Dragon Blade. Ask Google. I'm sure Google can find it for you. Um, there's this part where like, I think like Adrian Brody is Crassus' son and he's the legionary general and they like make this flag and then sing this anthem at it it's it's incredible i love that movie it's it's not really accurate but it's cool at any rate uh crassus however does not survive this battle. Now, according to some versions, this is done to his dead body, but I'm gonna go with the version where he's still alive because it hurts more and it's a better story. Uh, however, this story is tenuous and conflicting. So the king of Parthia said, captures Crassus, has him in his presence, and he said, you know, 
if you love gold so much, why don't we like give you some gold? In fact, here, here's some gold. And he takes out this molten gold from a uh, crucible and then he pours it into Crassus's throat. Now, if Crassus were still alive, this would kill him on contact. If he were dead, it would just be a humiliating waste of gold, but it's pretty easy to re-extract the gold from the remains later of the cremation. So uh, if you really want to make a point with a dead body, it's expensive, but super cool. And for those of you for whom this sounds familiar, like uh, Game of Thrones season one familiar, that's where the idea came from. It's uh, not original. So that scene, it could have been worse. But that hasn't happened yet. That's in 53 BCE. We're first meeting Crassus during Spartacus's revolt. But you need to hold on to your hats, because before we go there, we have to meet a slightly younger man, the second member of this first triumvirate. And that is, drumroll, Pompey the Great, Pompeius Magnus. Oh, Pompey, Pompey. He was the military genius of his generation, and he was hugely popular on both sides of the aisle, like wide bipartisan appeal to this dude, because he won frequently and pretty easily, not just military victories, but also diplomatic victories with military force. The Senate charged him with several wars in hot zones around the Mediterranean, including at one point a crisis involving piracy from the Illyrian coast. The Illyrian coast is modern day uh, Croatia. It's that coast opposite the um, eastern shore of Italy. And there are a lot of inlands there, a little bit like the Outer Banks in North Carolina is. So to the Illyrians, this was the fleet of Illyria. To the Romans, this is the Illyrian pirates. That's an unrecoverable and perhaps semantic question. Uh, be that as it may, Pompey sided with Sulla during Sulla's dictatorship. Uh, this likely was a pragmatic strategy, but it doesn't mean that Pompey wasn't also complicit. Like, you know, he was. You don't do this without being complicit. But he was distant enough from the goings on in the prescriptions that he didn't get quite crassus levels of disapprobation. He has an interesting name, you know. His first name is Gnaeus. I haven't included it here. Pompeius is his nomen. Magnus, he didn't inherit that cognomen. This is a name that apparently one of his first commanding officers, when he was just a little thing entering in mil into military service, he apparently had a bit of an ego on him. So his commanding officer called him Pompey Magnus. Magnus means the great as kind of an ironic nickname. And Pompey was like, thank you. Yeah, I am Pompey the Great. And let me show you why. And he made it stick, which is just uh, nickname goals. I wish that I could call myself Molly the Great and make it stick. Um, but alas, the only person who calls me that is my mom. And it's really embarrassing. So please don't. It's kind of not what I'm here for anyway. I'm not a fan of greatness. It usually ends too much, involves too much mass murder. So <clears throat> Pompey the Great, as I said, was involved in a lot of military successes. And here I'm just giving you the highlights. So he is the guy who finally takes Mithridates down in the second war against Mithridates. Uh, some people number three wars with Mithridates because there's one that's a war of aggression. Uh, I'm just talking about the two invasions of Pontus by Romans, first under Sulla and the next under Pompey the Great. Uh, Pompey seals the deal. He hunts Mithridates down. Mithridates is finally forced to kill himself to avoid capture. And Pompey then steals Mithridates' library and makes one of his freedmen, a guy named Pompeius Linnaeus, 
translate Mithridates library into Latin so everybody could read it. This is another thing that Pompey does well. Like it's you're missing a trick if you think of him just as a military success. He was also really into making culture accessible to as many Romans as possible. And this is part of how he managed to be so popular despite a lingering stink from the Sully years lingering around him is that he endowed accessible libraries. Eventually he builds a theater. We're about to look at a reconstruction of that a theater that becomes very ironic in another couple of decades. Uh, he was assiduous about veterans affairs, not just protecting his own veterans, but reinstating legislation that favored veterans and ensured their benefits on retirement. This is a win-win move all around, but it does make him very popular on the streets, even with people who don't necessarily share his political leanings. And he is uh, optimatus. Um, not a popularis, but some of his legislation is middle of the aisle. He's one of these um, centrist optimates, as opposed to Crassus, who's, I think his political party is money. Um, he is involved with Crassus's co-consul in the year when Spartacus's revolt is finally put down. I'm going to tell you more about that in a few slides, so I'm just going to mention it here and move on. Um, as I mentioned, he creates a settlement mm -hmm. that reduces piracy, that is, raids on merchant ships in the Mediterranean shipping lanes. <laughs> Um, with the authority of uh, decree of the Senate, the Lex Gabinia. And then finally, he was an advocate and a sponsor for a lot of these uh, friendly kings. I mentioned one of them <laughs> earlier. You may remember Ptolemy, Cleopatra VII's father, Ptolemy the flute player. That Ptolemy uh, was sponsored by Pompey, uh, and likely he got his Roman citizenship as part of that sponsorship. That is important to remember because in a few decades, Pompey is going to be in a really desperate situation. He's going to need help, refuge, safety in the face of overwhelming odds and an unstoppable force. And he's going to go to his friends, the Ptolemies, in the kingdom of Egypt. We'll find out how that turns out for him on another slide. I've included this map, by the way, just to give you an idea of the scope of Pompey's conquests. Um, Armenia, the, the bit labeled Armenia, and all of the yellow territory next to it is what Pompey gets when he conquers Mithridates, including Thrace. Uh, Egypt is in a lighter yellow because it's a friendly kingdom. <laughs> and then he also is heavily involved in campaigns in Mauritania. So this is a period at which um, a North African king named Juba <laughs> tries to break from Rome. It doesn't work out well for him. Uh, that's, uh, sorry, not Juba, Jugurtha. Uh, and this happens, of course, m very early in Pompey's career, but it's important to point out. It's, that's part of his pedigree. He's personally responsible <laughs> for adding a huge amount of territory to Rome. Well, I'm glad you're enjoying this. Here's that theater I was talking about. In 55 BCE, this is two years before Crassus hauls off and get, gets himself killed in uh, on the Parthian border, Pompey endows a public theater. And this was a new one. You know, theater isn't new in Rome. We've read a Roman play, right? But there wasn't a permanent theater building in Rome. There were wooden scaffolds often built just for the run of the play. Uh, they would be sponsored by the uh, city officials in charge of public games and entertainment and the food supply, the ediles. Pompey, by building a permanent theater, made sure that every time somebody went to see a play, they were going to a Pompey ad. And this continued to be a really useful public space, especially since the Senate House by now was crumbling and uh, difficult to use. When 
uh, a guy named Clodius is murdered about midway through the century. His body is burnt in the Senate House, and then the Senate House is entirely unavailable. So the Senate meets in a variety of temple spaces around the city, including the theater of Pompeii, or Pompey rather. Pompeii is the city, Pompey is the person. Um, I'm not going to get too flustered if you say it one way or the other, though, because it's Pompeius in Latin, so it's just an English language thing. Here's what the theater of Pompey looks like now. That is, it doesn't. There's nothing left, and we're not exactly sure about where it is in the forum because later buildings are on top of it. But advances in archaeology have allowed us to hone in on the most probable location. This is likely where it is, and this is the uh, hypothetical footprint of the building, at least our best guess for it. Central Rome, right on the edge of the Forum. This is prime real estate, and this is the kind of thing that not just Pompey is doing, this is going to be a big part of what Caesar and then Augustus and also Marcus Antonius, Roman politicians notice that when Pompey uses his own money to build the city a theater, his popularity goes through the roof. It's enough that he is the most val uh, viable challenger to Caesar when this turns into a civil war. <laughs> and uh, for those of you aspiring future military dictators, here's the thing you should do. Finance the arts, build spaces for the arts, give people fun stuff to do that doesn't involve killing their fellow citizens and they will love you. People love to be entertained, and they can overlook a lot of sketchy shit if you're entertaining. I'm not going to comment further on that. I'm sure you can come to your own conclusions about how that works in our world. We've got to talk about Spartacus at this point. This happens in 73 to 71 BCE. Now, this is before Pompey builds his theater, before Crassus goes to Parthia. This is um, about a decade after uh, Sulla. Sulla's reign of terror happens in 81 BCE, um, 71 BCE, about 10 years later. One of the things that is deeply destabilizing and destabilized by Sulla's reign of terror is that when you kill large numbers of upper class people, in a society where slave ownership and enslaved labor is a larger and larger part of your economy, you create a weakness in a chain of domination and unfair human treatment that breaks a little bit more easily, which is what happens with Spartacus. It was an embarrassment that this incident begins in 73 and ends in 71 BCE. This is a little over two years in which Spartacus and his followers gain massive numbers, rampage through the Italian countryside, uh, inducing lots of enslaved people to join them. They finance themselves and feed themselves by appropriating stuff off of Roman farms, which considering why they're enslaved in the first place, I think is fair. But ancient Romans did not. This. Uh, it caused quite a stink. And at first, one of the reasons why there was hesitation to put this revolt down with military force is that by calling out the official Roman yeah. army to deal with this, you're admitting that an enslaved person oh. is an enemy that is the kind of caliber oh. you need to put up against a Roman army. <laughs> For upper class Romans, this creates huge cognitive dissonance because they think of enslaved people as people they've already conquered on the battlefield who have chosen to live and therefore are not worth marching your army out. Now, the fact that not only did Rome had to march its actual army out against Spartacus and his followers, but also to use both consuls to do it. Um, Crassus is the, the leader at first, and he almost has the fight finished up. When Pompey swoops in at the end, his actions cause the decisive victory. But then Pompey takes credit mm -hmm. for the whole thing. 
and Crassus never gets over this. You may have gathered this from looking at Crassus's CV, but the man's ego was pretty massive and he does not have much of a sense of humor, not a very forgiving sort of guy. And this is essentially a situation where two co-presidents are, again, fighting over who won in a battle against enslaved people, right? So the levels of butt hurt and fragility are uh, quite high here. Uh, Spartacus and his colleague Crixus are the co-leaders of this. They escape from a gladiatorial school. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there's strongholds on Mount Vesuvius. Uh, the numbers given are difficult to verify, but ancient sources say about 70,000. Um, I need to come up with a better way of phrasing this. Runaway slaves makes it sound like they're doing something wrong. They're not. Uh, Self-liberating, perhaps, might be a, a bit better phrasing here. And then for two years, they thumb their nose at Rome. Now, a question that's been asked of this revolt is, why didn't they leave Italy? Like, what was their long-term plan? This, I didn't have a great answer for, but is a really interesting question. Had they managed to get out of Italy somehow, maybe they might have fared better. But I don't think that was the point of this revolt. They were hoping that they, like a lot of other people up in the mountains away from the urban center of Rome, could live their lives without Rome caring enough to take them out. But uh, it just wasn't to be. A note before we proceed about gladiators. I mentioned in an earlier lecture, but I'm just going to say it again. Uh, gladiators are usually gladiators because they were at one point enemy combatants, but they can also be bought and trained from scratch. And these are people who are under a living death sentence. Now, sometimes people get to be a gladiator through the criminal justice system. Lower class defendants who were found guilty of certain capital crimes would be sentenced to fight in the arena, and this is a way that you could uh, potentially earn your way back. Part of what's so, pardon my French and cover your ears, Jimmy, but fucked up about this is that the Romans are giving desperate people this one last chance at life and freedom, a freedom that has been taken away from these folks in violation of their basic human rights. And they're being forced to fight each other for the entertainment of a crowd. Now, at the highest levels of gladiatorial competition, there was a conservative approach to the health and safety of the people involved. Uh, they had health care provided. Uh, it wasn't normal that you were risking your death in every bout. Uh, they had measures in place so that they would bleed impressively, but not necessarily die as regularly as one might think. Um, the way movies make it look a lot, gladiators are just dying left and right with this huge attrition rate. Now, in the minor leagues of gladiatorial competition, and also in the early parts of a gladiatorial show, people do die at these huge rates because that's the entry level from the criminal justice system. So you, you have to be careful when you push back against this idea that being a gladiator was really just like being a prof in a professional sport that you could sometimes die from. Uh, we soft or we have backpedaled a little bit as historians in a correction. Um, High-ranking gladiators were relatively well taken care of, but this is still an inherently exploitative system that runs on the systematic public murder of already oppressed populations. And the death rate is still very high under a certain fame bracket. But part of how they kept people invested in the system, and the reason why it wasn't a more common thing for the trained combatants in gladiatorial schools to use their weapons to liberate themselves is because the system incentivizes collaboration and cooperation. Systems in which people are oppressed, they don't 
just happen because powerful people who are super dickish are always horrible to everyone. They happen because they create these little incentives for people who are being oppressed by the system, but not as badly as somebody else, to go along with it and cooperate. Uh, this is how white supremacy continues to function. Uh, this is a, an effective and unfortunately deeply ingrained dynamic in human cultures. I don't know that I have a great solution for it either. Well, this is an uplifting lecture, but I think it's important to name it and take care in the ways that we nuance it and discuss it. But I just don't find gladiators fun. The whole concept just makes me heart sick because the, these are humans and this was somebody's life and what a horrible way to live. Nonetheless, gladiators are a perennial favorite at the box office, and uh, here are some examples up there for you, which I find is part of my discomfort with this, is that we are still enjoying watching the suffering of human beings on the big screen. Like The people we're watching aren't as endangered. We are nicer to our Hollywood actors and stunt people. But we're still watching, and that that's a, a complicated thing, you know, and something I think about with my own TV viewing habits. I like violent shows, and what does that say about me? You know, I just don't know. But sometimes the best you can do is acknowledge it and sit with it and think how to do better. On to the end. Uh, this is a sound bite from Plutarch. I think this is Plutarch's life of Crassus. Um, as I mentioned, Crassus almost has it in the bag, and then Pompey comes in, slaughters 5,000 of Spartacus's forces, and claims victory. At this point, those who are captured alive are systematically rounded up and crucified along the Appian Way, which is the major road going north to south into the city of Rome from southern Italy. And this was for miles and miles along this road. If you were going to the city of Rome to do your business, I just imagine if 695 was lined with wooden beams where people were slowly suffocating to death while nailed to wood and you're not in a car either you're on a horse or with a donkey or walking and you're walking past this the level of systematic disrespect being shown to this enemy is really telling this is part of rome's vocabulary of psychological warfare you may recall one of the perks of roman citizenship is that you're never crucified so this is a way of saying now, you are not a citizen. And in some ways, you are not a full human being in our culture. Not only are you not a full human being, but your death is to be displayed in order to make a point about the power of Rome and the cost of defying Rome's power. It's meant to be gruesome and it is meant to be confrontational and it is meant to be gut turning, but also dehumanizing. When I imagine how I would react if I had to go down that road, knowing that if I tried to intervene, I would end up on one of those crosses, yeah? Um, I'm not sure what I would do. I'd like to think I'd find a way to not be a shitty person in this situation, but what a lot of people did, and this we know because this is how history panned out, is in their minds, they disconnected from the humanity of the people who were slowly dying above them. They walked past, or they made up stories in their heads about how this is what you get for defying Rome. And yes, Rome was provoked. You know, Rome is the victim here, not these people. This is how oppression functions. 
This is the social dynamic that keeps it going, is a dynamic in which we blame victims because the alternative to blaming victims is that we have to accept the possibility that we too can be on that cross. And that is a hard thing to do. Nobody wants to imagine themselves as the victim in this scenario, but we easily could be. So we tell ourselves that victims are victims for reasons we can prevent. But what it ends up doing is it makes us numb to other people's suffering and it encourages us to participate in the logic of people who are doing heinous things to our fellow human beings. Well, this is cheery. Let's talk about how this works out for Pompey and Crassus. Uh, the political takeaway from this is that Pompey and Crassus hate each other's guts after this. Crassus feels like Pompey is a glory hound who stole his thunder in a conflict that was already kind of sketchy. Crassus had money, but he wasn't a war hero. Pompey was a war hero. And after he defeats Mithridates especially, but even earlier, he has money because he's been sacking provinces. So Crassus is feeling a little threatened right here. And the two of them, even though they're both optimates, right, they're both supporting this party that uh, stems from Sulla that supports traditional nobility structures. They're unable to cooperate. And so to form an alliance is going to take something extra. Let's find out what that is, shall we? Before we do, we have to meet one more character. This is not a member of anybody's triumvirate. So sorry, Cicero. Uh, Cicero is like Marius, um, an Italian citizen from uh, Arpinum. Arpinum is in the hills south of Rome. I've got it up there on the map for you. Born in 106. And he, like Pompey, Pompey is another one of these um, new men outsiders. He sides with the Optimates. So he makes an alliance with traditional power structures. And they benefit from having him because they can point to Cicero and be like, well, look, under our systems, the good people, the right people can still rise to the top. So therefore, we are a meritocracy, not an inherited uh, aristocracy. Cute. It's a nice trick. I'll just leave that one there. So as I've mentioned, he's a Noah's homo. He's one of these first people in his family to have public office. Uh, he is not a war hero like Pompey. Rather, he's an advocate and a lawyer for people who don't have built-in representation. So he gets his clients as a patron, mostly through the court systems. So you may wonder, like, how did he get enough clients to be elected because he gets to be consul. Yeah, he gets to the top of the Cursus Sonorum. That's quite a trick if you're not a war hero. Well, the way he does this, uh, also, I don't think he cooperated with Sulla at all. He rather dodges that period a bit. He is not just the advocate for individual clients, but at one point, um, he ends up representing the entire island of Sicily and suing their former governor. Uh, varies the art thief. So he is able to swing a lot of the provincial vote by representing people who are well known in their hometowns. He also is a tireless self publicist. Nobody loves Cicero like Cicero loves Cicero. And this guy is legit eloquent. His Latin is beautiful. And he was diligent about publishing, circulating, uh, getting people who owed him favors to talk him up. Now, Cicero is a divisive figure among historians because some people, uh, especially in traditional history, look at him as a positive role model of good representative democratic virtues. 
in that he was a strong defender of representative forms of government over autocracies. He was a vigorous opponent of Marcus Antonius in the second triumvirate, and to a lesser extent, Caesar too. And he really pushed back at a lot of measures that he saw as threatening to Rome's pluralistic society. This is true to an extent. Uh, he also took cases that allowed him to style himself as a representative of the people against abuses. Um, the defending Sicily thing is one of these, but not always. Uh, you may recall the incident where in Clodia accused Caelius Rufus of trying to poison her. Cicero was the lawyer who got him off, not by arguing against any of the facts of the case, but by accusing Clodia of egregious sluttiness over and over and over again until she, her, her name was just shit in the city of Rome. Um, so that's one of the reasons why Cicero, for me, um, I can't love him at least as much as I did in high school. Um, full confession time here. I was a bit of a Cicero fan girl in high school. Um, plenty of the elders my dude now, although he's pretty problematic himself. Um, Cicero, I think, is a good example of the dangers that come from trying to maintain your power base from a centrist position in an increasingly divided society. At a certain point, if you're not willing to stand for hard things, what are you willing to stand for? On the other hand, he ends up at the end of his life dying because of his outspoken criticism against an increasing move towards autocracy and away from representative government, and he does eventually die as a martyr to representative politics. So I still have some affection for the guy. I, you know, he was a man of his time who I do think was trying, trying hard to be a good man in a difficult time. But what is good? Do any of us rise to that level? Um, he was complicated, I think complicated. Let's see if I mentioned everything. Uh, yes, so he does hold the consulship. Um, he's governor first of Sicily, and I'm not quite remembering where he ends up after his consulship. When he's consul, I mentioned this on the first slide. I'm not going to reiterate too much of this. We're not focusing on this for now. Uh, he was the opponent to uh, an alleged conspiracy on the part of the person he defeated in the elections, a guy named Lucius Sergius Catalina, or Catiline. Um, Catiline, interestingly, was from an old family, but a supporter of popular rights. He was in favor of the abolishment of debts and the uh, providing of more free grain, of a lot of uh, basic protections to the poor and the vulnerable. And if it sounds like I'm a bit of a Catiline partisan here, I kind of am a little bit, just to be contrary, because most of what we know about Catiline comes from this guy, this guy right here, Cicero. Cicero accuses Catiline of conspiring against the government, and then uh, according to some theories at least, kind of wags the dog until Catiline is forced to join with an armed rebellion in southern Italy where he dies fighting. But it's also quite probable that Catiline did indeed have a conspiracy against the state, a kind of a eat the rich, overthrow the powerful, take Rome back for the people kind of movement. It's irrecoverable. We'll never know. 
but part of what Cicero does with this situation is he capitalizes on it. He makes speeches, he postures, he turns this into a threat to the state. He asks and gets from the Senate the right to declare effectively martial law. During this crisis, he arrests Roman citizens and then executes them without a trial. Astute observers of Roman citizen rights may remember that a right to a trial is a basic Roman citizen right. If it sounds like Cicero ignored citizenship rights, well, he did. He ends up getting exiled for this later, and he has to beg to be let back into Rome. Eventually he is, but he's a sadder, more humble Cicero after this. He never really quite comes back from it because he loses his moral credibility. And this is the thing. When you mess with civil rights, you lose your ability to act as moral authority. So if you're going to be a pro-civil rights kind of person, you're going to have to be assiduous about this and you're going to have to resist the temptation to give in to fear and expediency to just this once, just for this emergency, take away civil rights. It's not going to work for you. Also, I think it's bad, but uh, bad people generally aren't swayed by that kind of argument, so uh, it's ineffective. It doesn't help. There are better ways to be a dictator. This brings us to the year 60. Uh, 63 is the year that Cicero and Catiline go at it. This is a symptom of a growing discontent, both from um, the people, the poor elements of the state, and also rising tensions between the optimates and populares. Because in the back of people's minds, um, 60, let's see, we're what? Is it 20 years out now from Sulla's prescriptions? Uh, it's not been that long. There, most adults still alive remember what it was like when Sulla marched on Rome. And they're worried that this divisive political era is going to end in bloodshed. So in this context, the two leading politicians who don't get along with each other very well, Crassus and Pompeius, uh, Marcus Linnaeus Crassus, Gnaeus Pompeius, Magnus, um, their portraits are on the slide, by the way, on the far left, uh, grouchy face there, that's Crassus. In the middle, there's Pompey, looking kind of like Goober. Uh, he's got this cowlick in the front, that was his signature look, was the, the messy bangs. And on the far right, we meet our next character in the cast, the young upstart, Gnaeus, or Gaius Julius Caesar. Now, Caesar got into this triumvirate not so much because he'd made his political reputation yet. At this point, he hadn't even invaded Gaul yet. We're not there. He'd been involved in a lot of military campaigns. He had credibility as a field commander. There were a lot of urban legends about him, but he also had a less than great reputation in the city of Rome itself. There were rumors that he'd slept with the king of Bithynia as part of a treaty negotiation, a guy named Nicomedes. Uh, now, the scandalous part wasn't that he slept with a guy. The scandal was that he bottomed for Nicomedes. And please don't make me explain that again if you're confused as to why that is a problem. Uh, the Roman family lecture goes there. Uh, this time, we will not. So he had been involved in that particular sex scandal, but also he was a notorious adulterer. One of his signature moves was to go to his political opponent's wives and get them to have sex with him, and then use that to humiliate his rivals. He also dressed in a way that was felt to be uh, a little too youthful and also a little too femme. He wore long tunics with long floppy sleeves. His toga wasn't tucked in right. This to straight-laced conventional Roman men was a threat. Uh, keep in mind Catullus. Yeah, this is a an environment of policed masculinity that is 
very unforgiving and Caesar is doing several things that are on everybody's list for behavior that's considered unmanly. Now the adultery thing might strike you as a little odd, right? Why is adultery unmanly? Like for us, sleeping with someone else's wife wouldn't be the first thing we think of when we're thinking of feminine men. But for Romans, a man controls himself. A man does not attack you through your family because that's a violation of the rights of a pater familias. No, no, no. You have to go through military routes or political routes. You, you don't sex your way to political power. And because this is a culture like our own, where we somewhat irrationally go for this feminizing label whenever we're trying to use gender as a lens through which to condemn people. That's where Romans go with this, is that, oh my goodness, you're a girly man because you adulterize people's wives. All right then. Okay, Romans. At any rate, uh, oh, oh, one more thing about Caesar. I'm not going to tell you too many Caesar facts because one of the things I'm having you read is Plutarch's biography of Julius Caesar. One of the things I'm going to ask you to do is find me some Caesar facts that aren't in this lecture. So I'm being editorially choosy about this. Um, oh gosh, what was the Caesar fact I was about to tell you? Gosh, then. Well, I can't remember. If it's important, I'll tell you later. Ah, okay, so here are a few things that I am going to tell you about Caesar. He was not born by a C-section. Now, Caesarian sections were a thing that was done in ancient Rome, but they were done to dead or dying um, parents. Um, because there's no way you could cut through a uterus without killing a patient under these circumstances. There's a huge blood supply going there. Uh, they don't have blood transfusion technologies. Uh, there's no sterile surgery. Without these things, you do not survive a C-section. Um, C-section survival didn't become achievable until we had the theory of circulation proven and spelled out, and that isn't until after um, even seeing us starts us on the path, Harvey finally gets us to a full articulation of the circulation of blood. But if you don't know that blood circulates, you don't know enough to stop somebody from bleeding to death in, in a C-section. So this was a thing that was done as a last ditch effort to save the baby when the mother was dying. Uh, it was just as common to sacrifice the child's life to save, save the mother. I'm not going to tell you how to do that in this lecture. So that's as far as we're going down that road. This legend is an ancient one, though. However, it's not about this Julius Caesar. It's about his distant, distant relative. It's a Pliny the Elder's story. One of the possible reasons for his name Caesar is this idea that his distant relative was born by one of these uh, emergency C-sections, but Caesar's mother was alive. This is not about him. No ancient person says it's about this. Uh, one of the more likely derivations, though, and another alternative Pliny discusses, is Caesius, which means um, having a full head of hair or hairy dude. And this was the one that Caesar didn't want you to think of because he started going bald very young, much like uh, Patrick Stewart. So um, Kiar and Hines here is how Caesar would like you to think of him. The image, for those of you unfamiliar, is from HBO's Rome. The bust is a portrait bust that's firmly identified with Julius Caesar and likely includes a lot more hair than the original. When he begins to go bald, he was allegedly very insecure about it. He had a, a comb forward. They didn't do comb overs in Rome. Instead, they would comb the hair from the back of the head forward. And then in order to secure it, at least according to some people, the facts of this are not in debate. He wins the right to wear his crown um, of leaves, one as a military honor at all times. This was unusual, and this was 
painted as a big civic honor, his enemies likely came up with the rest of this. Allegedly, he did this not because he wanted to be honored, but because it gave him a convenient way to keep his comb over from blowing away. Now, it's, going bald is nothing to be ashamed of. I'm not implying that it is. But it explains why Caesar was a little touchy about this, because this means he's a bald man named Harry. It's a joke that works really well in Latin, and he hated being made fun of. This is one of his berserk buttons. Caesar does not like being taken for granted. As I mentioned, he's related to Marius. He's his um, nephew. Um, you know what? I'm not going to tell you about the pirate incident. I'm going to let you look that up on your own. But the pirate story is fantastic, and one that you should really look into putting into your essay for this part of the course. As a young man, he was awarded the office of Pontifex Maximus. You may remember this from the religion lecture. This is the chief priest of Rome. He was very young for the position, and it was a position from which he claimed a lot of moral authority and something that his opponents saw as very offensive. It's a little bit like, um, I don't know, declaring somebody to be chaplain of the United States when they're also, um, I don't know, doing things that religious figures shouldn't do, like uh, abusing their constituents and stealing other people's wives generally frowned on in most people's religions. So he was deeply in debt to Crassus, as I mentioned earlier, and this is partly what gets him onto the short list for this first triumvirate. The first triumvirate, by the way, was a political cabal. It wasn't put together by the state. It wasn't official. They didn't all get pins in like a decoder ring. This was an agreement among the three of them to share power. Part of why Pompey and Crassus went for Caesar is that Caesar had Crassus a whole bunch of money, so he kind of had to do what Crassus told him to. Now, when he was pro-praetor in Spain, this is before he was elected consul, so after your praetor, you get to be a governor as a an ex-praetor in Latin, pro-praetor. He was particularly rapacious, and unlike the irremator praetor that you may remember from Catullus, he was very good about making sure that his loyal lieutenants got in on the action. He made back a lot of money, he paid Crassus back a lot of his money, but he still needed more because he was gonna run for consul. So in 60 BCE, he was elected with a guy named Bibulus. Bibulus was his co-consul. Caesar was the colleague. And that's partly what gets him on the first triumvirate, is that he's the consul. So they need him to make sure their legislation gets passed. Part of why this political organization is being founded is so that these three people could impose their own legislative agenda on Rome against the objections of their political opposition, one of whom was Bibulus. Now, Bibulus's constitutional function, because of the system of checks and balances, is co-consul. He was supposed to be able to stop Caesar from doing what Caesar ends up doing. And he tries. Lord love him, he tries. One of the constitutional powers you get as a consul is that when you are watching the sky for omens, when you're doing auguries, then no official business is supposed to be concluded because you're supposed to be waiting for the gods to give you their will and then you put the legislation through. This is a little bit like an ancient filibuster tactic. So Bibulus, at the very beginning of this consulship, he goes out to watch the skies for omens, thinking that Caesar can't pass any legislation while he's doing this and that he's effectively obstructing legislation. Ah, Caesar doesn't care. Uh, much like a honey badger, he continues to public, uh, not publish, pass all kinds of legislation that's being silently co-authored by Pompey and Crassus. He also forms this bridge between Pompey and Crassus, who hate each other's guts, and 
allows them to make an alliance for their political ends. But this is a very unstable alliance. And one of the major flaws here is that Pompey and Crassus, the established great men, the ones with the financial resources, the ones with the uh, proven track record, they assume that Caesar is their third guy. He's their alternate. He's disposable. He's the less important one. Uh, Caesar, however, is in this for Caesar. And we're about to see how spectacularly. Now, I mentioned that Catullus is not a Caesar fan. Here are a few of Catullus's anti-Caesar poems. You've already read another one. Uh, Mamura, this guy that's mentioned in Catullus 57. Mamura is one of Caesar's henchmen. He's the guy that Catullus works for in Bithynia. He's the Irumator Praetor, that guy. The guy who won't give Catullus any kickbacks. Part of why Catullus expects a kickback, and he's writing poetry about like, God damn it, what, where's my kickback? Is that Mamura, well, he was part of the Caesar regime and anybody who was on the Caesar train was getting that sweet, sweet Caesar train money. This was how Caesar built his base. And this is how he continued to function. And remember in 53, um, by 53, Crassus is feeling pretty insecure and within a decade of Caesar's consulship in 60, Caesar, Caesar's star is on the rise, Crassus is gone, Pompey's is on the wane. So this works out really well for him. It is very effective to make sure that your henchmen get paid. Please don't make me regret giving you that advice. So let's see. The first one I want to talk about, Catullus 93, astute observers who have taken intermediate Latin may recognize this one. Um, this ends with a line, uh, I don't want to please you, Caesar, or to know which of the two you are. Are you evil or are you good? Um, the word in Latin for good and evil. Evil is ater and good is album. Uh, some people mistranslate this as black or white. That's not what this means. I mean, they do refer to the colors, but this is before the invention of color theories for human race. Uh, it's a social construct and a really modern one. We don't start seeing its origins until the 1600s, really. Race is different in Rome. Rather, it's referring to a voting method, wherein if you're voting for death, you would put in a dark pebble, and if you're voting for life, you'd put in a white pebble, um, a light colored pebble. So the color contrast is meant to be like light equals not death. Death is dark colored and not necessarily black, but you know, black shadowy, because we imagine death is in the underworld, which is under the ground, and under the ground it is dark usually. Um, this poem is an extra Bernie burn because Catullus is noticing something about Caesar. Caesar is never more happy than when you're talking about Caesar. Caesar, you're about to read some of his war diaries from the, the Gallic Wars. He talks about himself in the third person, People who talk about themselves in the third person have a certain opinion of their importance, yes? Caesar was a megalomaniac, and the one thing that would make him super, super angry is if you don't care that he exists. So Catullus 93 consists of a massive burn where he's like, you know what, Caesar? You're irrelevant to me. You're so irrelevant to me. I don't even care if you're evil or not. <laughs> nice. Uh, unfortunately, he mentioned Caesar's name, so like we, we know who it's about. So Catullus must care enough to write two lines, at least. Um, the next one here, I'm not going to unpack too much. Uh, we have some standard slut shaming. Uh, this I've included because it gives you an idea of the kind of things Caesar's opponents are saying to slut shame him. And slut shaming is really at the core of what's going on here. There's slut shaming, there's gender slut shaming, all of which comes out of this tactic 
wherein to turn the Roman people against you, one of the effective tactics is you can gender police. This one is unfortunately still a perennial thing. Um, also calling him an adulterer. That one is down in there too, because adulterer equals them. Uh, Catullus, for all he pushes back at gender, he's quite fluent in um, weaponized gender language. This chart I've included so you can see how all of these people are related to each other. I find this really helpful. I'm not going to talk about it too much, but the slide exists and it's worth keeping open while you go to read the reading so you keep track of which names are important and who the hell these people are. So Crassus is connected to Caesar with money. Caesar is married to a Pompeia who dies in 61. That marriage doesn't end well. He divorces her earlier for alleged adultery. Um, the story goes that after he divorced her, she was involved in the sex scandal. Caesar claimed, oh, no, she wasn't actually like cheating on me, but I'm divorcing her anyway. And then people were like, well, Caesar, if she didn't actually cheat, why are you divorcing her? Huh? And he's like, oh, yeah, well, Caesar's wife has to be above suspicion. That there's the logic. And of course, he talks about himself in the third person because that's how Caesar talks. Sometimes you'll hear that referred to, so it's worth mentioning. I've included his likely marriage to Cleopatra the Seventh. This marriage was almost certainly a legal marriage in Egypt, but it wasn't a legal marriage in Rome. So Caesar, at this point in his life, was effectively a polygamist married to both Cleopatra the Seventh and then Calpurnia in Rome. Uh, I've also included Caesar's sister, uh, Julia the Younger, who you know, I'm not sure if this this is correct or not. I, I think their child is Attia, who is the mother of Octavian. Octavian's his grandnephew. I've left a woman out of this chart. Oh dear, that's a problem. But I've recorded too much of the slide. Um, I'll fix that in post-production. But Octavian is important because he's gonna be Caesar's heir and his name is gonna change eventually. So he's not involved in any of this right now, but this is how the um, first triumvirate cements its alliance with, at the family level. So Caesar marries a Pompeia, doesn't last. And then Caesar's only child, a daughter named Julia, marries Pompey. There's a huge age gap. I think he's in his, what, 60s at this point, And she's 18 when they marry, 17, 18. This, for us, is a gap. For Romans, it's still a bit of a gap, but it's not an unusual gap. And at the time, it was considered a remarkable marriage, not because of the age gap, but because they were a really affectionate couple in public, and that wasn't considered appropriate. It was undignified for a husband to show his wife too much affection where other people could see. And although this was a political marriage, it does seem to have been um, based on a certain amount of fondness, if not outright love. I mean, that's unrecoverable, but it caused a good deal of consternation among Pompey's female groupies, of which he had quite a number. He was a bit like Gaston in that way, where he, he'd walk by and Roman ladies would swoon. When Julia became his wife and they were in love, a lot of people were super upset that he was off the market. I'm bringing this up because this ends in tragedy. Julia gets pregnant with her first child with Pompey and when she goes into labor she's unable to deliver and if the fetus becomes stuck as you're giving birth 
in a society that doesn't have access to C-sections, that's not always survivable. And in Julia's case, it wasn't. Uh, she labored until her uterus gave out and eventually she died uh, three days into the experience. And a Caesar, even though he was perfectly capable of marrying his teenage daughter off to his political ally, it was to all accounts, and we have no reason to doubt this, very fond of his daughter, Julia, and was absolutely stricken and heartbroken when she died. And this caused a breach between Caesar and Pompey that never quite got fixed. This is one of the proximate causes of the next major civil war we're going to get into. Not the only cause, but certainly part of this constellation of growing bad blood. But it's an important one to keep in mind, too, because this is one of these political marriages I was talking about, where the woman isn't relevant just because she's being married off. While alive, she created a channel of communication between Pompey and Caesar. The triumvirate almost broke up at one point, and she was likely instrumental in getting that to gel back together. In fact, not likely she was. This marriage was part of fixing that breach. And her absence in antiquity and among modern scholars is perceived as the major, or at least one of the major fault lines in, in this alliance. And certainly with Crassus gone and Julia dead, not only dead, but dead because she was effectively killed as a result of her political marriage. Things are, things are broken. They're terribly, terribly broken. And it's about to end in blood and tears for everybody in the Roman world. We're not there yet though. We've got to talk about what happens to Caesar after his year as consul. You may have been asking, okay, so Caesar passes a bunch of legislation while his co-consul is obstructing. None of these laws are legal. Why doesn't somebody just sue Caesar? Remember with Tiberius Gracchus, the thing that Tiberius was worried about is when he ceases to be tribune, what if he gets sued for illegal actions as tribune? Well, Caesar has to worry about this as well, and his enemies are there and waiting. When you're done being consul, uh, remember, while you hold public office, you can't be sued. So all lawsuits have to wait until you're a private citizen again. You're supposed to get to be governor of a province for a year, and then you're back to private citizen status. So his political enemies just wanted to wait a year and then sue Caesar's butt. Ah, uh, but there is an uh, escape clause to this. By now, it was pretty standard that... <laughs> yes, that's right, James. While you were a provincial governor, if a foreign war broke out, then your consul, or your proconsulship rather, would be extended for the duration of that war, if that war was necessary. So Caesar right now is very incentivized to get sent to govern a province that turns into a war zone. Now, his enemies are on to him. The first place they give him to be governor of is uh, governor of the forests of Italy. They essentially make him a ranger, a forest ranger. And the idea is that, okay, there's no way he can start a foreign war if we make him in charge of the Ents. But in a stroke of luck, probably luck, the governor who was supposed to go to size Alpine Gaul um, drops out, Caesar's promoted to the Po River Valley, and then the governor of Transalpine Gaul 
dies suddenly, leaving Rome in the lurch. And then Caesar swoops in and gets the authority to govern both Gaul on the Rome side of the Alps and Gaul on the uh, other side of the Alps. Now, wouldn't you know it, within a few months of Caesar taking office, some shenanigans start. Uh, there's a tribe called the Allobroge, or not the Allobroge, sorry, the uh, Helvetii, they're on the map there, begin a migration from their traditional homeland to find better, wider um, living space. They bring their women and children, and according to Caesar, again, Caesar is our only source for this, and you can kind of forget that because he's writing in the third person. Um, what I'm having you read in part are little bits of Caesar's account of his own Gallic Wars, and I'll let him explain why this was a totally unavoidable war. I'm going to tell you what this looks like just looking at a, a map. So the Allobroges are that tribe south of Lake Geneva, modern day Geneva, like um, Switzerland. North of the Allobroges are the Helvetii in this narrow uh, bit of land. Now the Allobroges were recently conquered by the Romans. They were now friendly, but they hadn't been friendly for long, and they were very likely to flip. So when the Helvetii begin marching into their territory, Caesar argues that, well, the Allobroges are friends of Rome, and they're recently pacified, so we have to defend them from this foreign invasion, or else horrible things are going to happen. And in some ways, he's using Marius' example. This is exactly the geographical region in which Marius repelled the invasion of the Cimbri and the Teutones. So Caesar is doing something that has a precedent, that has a lot of political good feeling behind it. You know, fighting Gauls by now is freaking traditional. It's a little odd to fight Gauls in order to protect other Gauls. But here I'm going to give you the non-Caesar argument against this being a legit cause for war, because the Helvetii were trying to move down that river coming out of Lake Geneva into the north. So they really weren't going through a lot of Allobroges territory, and they were petitioning the Allobroges just to pass through. Now, was it necessary for Caesar to immediately recruit three extra legions to take all of the men he had in his one legion on the other side of the Alps, immediately march them right up to Lake Geneva, and blockade them, burning down the bridge? That's probably an overreaction. However, once Caesar had done it, there was a war. There may not have been a war when he started, but there certainly was a war when he was finished. And the Senate was under a lot of pressure to make it a legal war after the fact. Caesar claimed that he had to take action swiftly. He couldn't wait for the Senate. His opposition said, this is an illegal war. Caesar is obviously starting a war, so we can't sue his butt. And the Senate's like, well, yeah, he's probably doing that, but it seems like a legit war to me. And then Caesar begins to win. So they extend his governorship for five years. They eventually extend it another five years because wouldn't you know it, Caesar's war of aggression sparks um, resistance movements, which spike, spark further wars. This ends with multiple acts of genocide. Oh, we recently found the bodies from one of these a few years ago. So this I can say with confidence, Caesar commits genocide of the Helvetii. <laughs> and certain other groups as well. Um, eventually, he ends up adding all of, or at least most of what is now modern day France. Jimmy, 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 why are you not bothering your father? Most of what is now modern day France as a Roman province, and with it, so much wealth. Now, if you listen to Caesar, it sounds like Gaul is just a bunch of mud huts and very little political organization. This archaeology has shown is uh, not quite accurate. This was a thriving network of many cultures united by religion and some of them language. 
decentralized but still thriving this was a hot spot for metallurgy for mining for uh, trade from the north sea and baltic amber and beaver oil so this is a very wealthy area and it's also a really good choice to start a war because there isn't political unity in this large region of this isn't a nation of france um, caesar divides it for his own convenience into these three ethnocultural regions uh, the aquitani the Celta, and the belgai but it's uh it's a network of kinship groups who have conflicts internally amongst themselves this is part of what caesar uses this is not the first time and it's not going to be the last time somebody uses this as an excuse to start a war saying that oh they're divided internally they need us to come in and impose order and we're really doing them a favor by conquering them i'm not going to waste a lot of effort explaining why that is pretty screwed up but nonetheless this is what caesar does here and this is the context for the reading I've given you from Caesar's own pen. Ah, yes, I also need to talk about what that is that you're reading. Caesar's Gallic Wars were written by Julius Caesar, and it's easy to miss this because he never says I, he just says Caesar. So Caesar will write to you that Caesar had to raise a legion and cross the Alps and conquer and so and so forth. Caesar just sounds like a really awesome guy, and you can forget that the person who's telling you that Caesar is awesome is, um, Caesar. This is a common tactics. We still use, see it used today. Uh, Bob Dole was really into this for some reason. In Caesar's case, though, this has led a lot of people to forget that Caesar has an agenda and to think that, well, gosh, Caesar is just an awesome commander because look at how good he looks in his own campaign diaries. What's really genius about these, though, is that not only is he fighting the war abroad, but he's sending these back as the events happen to Rome to be distributed as his own foreign correspondent service. So he's creating his own media body. And that's what the Gallic Wars is. It's not written for Caesar's men in Gaul. It's written for the people back in Rome so that Caesar can win hearts and minds to support his very sketchy and probably illegal war. Romans aren't looking at maps that look like the one we're looking at right now. It wouldn't have been as immediately obvious that the Helvetii weren't um, necessarily invading Roman territory. Likely they did just want to cross over and Caesar saw an opportunity and went for it. That's one of the takeaways from Caesar though. Controlling the narrative is a key part of maintaining autocracy. Autocracy can't stand to have divergent voices. It can't tolerate a uh, free press. It needs to control and sculpt the narrative in order to continue to function which is why journalism is one of the first and best defenses against autocracy. We've also got to talk about the Druids, folks. One of the great ironies of history in the ancient world and history of religion is that our best written source about the religion of Gaul is Caesar. There were other ancient writers who tell us about the Druids, some of whom have survived a lot who haven't, but most of our information about what the Druids believed, what they taught, how that religion functioned, comes from Caesar. And that is not a great source. It's a little bit like trying to write a history of, um, oh gosh, uh, Islam is written by Fox News commentators or um, uh, Christianity if you were um, no, I'm forgetting the guy's name at the moment but if you're uh, reading an atheist's blog although not always a lot of atheists are quite fair um, what I'm saying here 
is that Caesar, as one of the only sources, is wobbly at best. However, because of the way Druids worked, this is what we've got. And I've chosen this section of Caesar's discussion to, I mean, actually not this session, I think I've got it on another slide to give you an idea of why we're in the situation we're in. But this is our best statement of the core belief of Druidic religion. And it's an interesting one. So this is an idea of transmigration of human souls. It's not clear if this is reincarnation with animals involved. This seems to be just the souls of dead humans go into newborn humans and get recycled. Caesar goes on to tell us that the reason why Druids believe this is so that they won't fear death. This is the part that should give you pause. The belief is probably legit. We have no reason to think this is not what Druids believed. It's in keeping with other evidence that survived. But probably Druids are not thinking, and this will make our followers bloodthirsty because they won't fear death. Um, um, maybe people do go into religions for badassery reasons, but it is unlikely and we should raise a brow at that. Rather, what we have going on is Caesar is telling you what he wants you to know about the Druids and what he wants you, the Roman reader, to know. It's in a stroke dehumanizing. It's saying, like, they're not like us, okay? They're not afraid of death in the same way that we're afraid of death. They think that death is just a reset button and then they get to go right back into another body. And that's what makes them a completely different enemy, a dangerous enemy, an enemy that we just must have a war with. And who benefits from people believing this? Well, Caesar. Now, that said, we do have remains of sites tied to exercise of Druid religion, and this is one of them. Uh, interestingly, Stonehenge is not that. The henge moniker here is a convenient word used in Britain for these round structures of stone or wood. Uh, this, though, is likely uh, a Druid site. Stonehenge is much, much older than that. This is on a coastal floodplain, so sometimes it's underneath the tide, sometimes it's above the tide, and it constitutes a wooden palisade with a little opening on one side, and then inside is maybe an altar, we're not sure that's what it is, but it's an oak tree that's been cut out from below the roots and planted top down into the seabed. We know that water is a common denominator for sites linked with Druidic religion. It's a place where you leave offerings to the gods of Druidism. It's a place where you go to pray. So we think that this is some kind of a connection with the world. Uh, the tree upside down perhaps suggests it's a world that's a mirror to our own. Um, if I can borrow a Stranger Things metaphor, it's the upside down. It's our world, but on its head. And taken with Caesar's comments about resurrection and reincarnation, it's likely that this is thought of as a portal where you go in dead and then you rise again, like you're bounced back from a mirror reflection. Now, one thing that Caesar alleges and other ancient sources do too, and the archeological record confirms, is that at least in certain circumstances, Druids did practice human sacrifice. We have no evidence that this is what's going on at Seahenge, but I want to address that right now. And I'm gonna do so the same way I did with Carthaginian human sacrifice. That is, I'm gonna make the case for it because it's just too easy to do like a Roman does and get on your high horse about human sacrifice in a judgy kind of way. That misses the point and it's disrespectful, especially to a religion that um, was a life belief for a lot of people. And uh, to a certain extent, I'm 
not going to treat it as a living tradition, although it is. There are people who are using a kind of neo-Druidism as their religion. It's also part of the neo-pagan community. And I'm not here to bash neo-pagans because that is a religion worthy of our respect. But I want to be clear, too, that this practice structure for Druidism is not, at least I'm aware, what modern Druids are doing. At least I haven't met any who sacrifice people. But I'm going to make the case for it, and here's why. Um, we have here an illustration from one of many editions of Caesar's Gallic Wars, and this is part of your other reading. This is the Wicker Man incident. For this, we don't have any contemporary archaeological remains, so we have yet to find an actual Wicker Man, likely because this isn't the sort of thing that leaves great archaeological evidence. This is a uh, human figure in which people are being stuffed and then the whole thing is set on fire. There's no ev effort to cover it or bury it. It doesn't tend to happen on the swampy soil that preserves wood well. I don't think we're ever going to find a wicker man, although if we do, let me know. Some modern scientists have tried to use experimental archaeology to prove or disprove the wicker man as a ritual. People have tried to stuff large wicker effigies with as many people as possible, and they've had a hard time keeping it from falling over, and have thus argued that this is unlikely. But I don't have any great reason to doubt Caesar, partially because although we haven't found wicker men, we have found sites that appear to be religiously affiliated or at least ritualized in the world where Druidism was the majority religion, that is modern day France, uh, bits of Spain, Britain, where there are remains uh, of human beings on display, one of which is Ribemont Suancre. I'm probably butchering the pronunciation here. So this is in modern day Belgium, the territory of the Belgae, According to Caesar, these are the most badass of the badass Gauls. Not quite as badass as the Germani, but reasonably badass. At the site, on one side, we found a framework, the remnants of a wooden framework and a platform, and then a bunch of human skeletons next to human weapons. But the thing that struck us on investigation was that there aren't any skulls, which is unusual, yes. Uh, normally, oh gosh, the TV is on in here. This is a mess. Um, here, let me pause. I am gonna finish this recording if it kills me. Okay, where was I? Right, Reba Mosso and Cry. Nearby, they found the skulls buried separately. Not just that, but the positioning of the skeleton showed that before the scaffolding collapsed into the pit that preserved all of these remains, they were tied to a rack, so they were in battle formation. What we think happened here is that the losers in some kind of a territorial dispute were beheaded and then tied in their armor onto a framework so that the first thing you saw when you were coming into Belgai territory was the headless bodies of the last people who tried to invade them. That's a great one if you ever want to really intimidate your enemies, so uh, keep that in mind. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean this is a religious site. Uh, remember I said ritual. Not all rituals are religious rituals. We do some rituals for politics. Uh, voting is a ritual. Uh, watching C-SPAN, that's kind of a ritual. Vetting president's speech, looking at Snopes, that's a political ritual. So just because you're beheading people and putting their lifeless bodies on the, the edge of your territory doesn't mean that a druid did it. But we find other sites that are spaced in a way that indicate it's not part of the settlement. Um, there tend to be structures around that don't have habitation involved with them. So likely they're a, 
they they tend to be in groves too, which we know is associated with druids. Uh, druid, the word, comes from the Greek word for oak tree. The oak tree seems to have been sacred in druidic religion and continues to be sacred in folk traditions in ex-druid areas long after Rome succeeds in its systematic erasure of druids from the map of northern Europe. So these sites likely are religiously linked. Uh, we know that headhunting was a big part of northern European war culture, and it does seem to be something religiously sanctioned. So I think that the weight of evidence suggests that before the conquest at the hands of Rome, human sacrifice was a part of the ritual of warfare and likely acceptable under the religious system instituted by the Druids. I think that some of the resistance to this is from Europeans who don't like to think of their ancestors indulging in headhunting for reasons I don't think I have to explain uh, that sound a little bit like Eurocentrism. I'm just go, gonna go on the record here. My ancestors very likely were headhunters and I, I'm okay with that. I see why you would do this. Uh, I myself am not a headhunter. I just wanna put that out there. I don't hold with murdering myself, but I get why. So, Ah, uh, yes, the last thing I wanted to say, I thought I had a slide, but I don't. Um, so why is it that we don't have Druid accounts of how Druidism works? Well, this is something Caesar gives us a clue to in the, the reading I've given you. He tells us that Druids believe that it's not right to put sacred knowledge into letters that that both allows people who haven't been vetted to know too much about the belief system, but it also means that when you put things into writing, you're not trying as hard to remember them. And for a real druid, they have to know their religious lore and history inside and out. Caesar tells us they did this through an oral tradition of memorized verses and poetry and songs. Now, at first, because we come from a literate and text-based culture, like Caesar did, uh, even more so than Caesar though, we tend to privilege written information and think that you're not doing it right if you're not writing it down. This is something that still tends to make it very difficult for modern neo-pagans to be taken seriously, because now we're in a culture where most religions are based around single book texts, the wording of which is really important, and the reading of that text is part of your worship language and experience. So a lot of us who grow up in that kind of tradition have a hard time understanding what belief feels like in an oral tradition and how orally transmitted knowledge can be as legitimate and as fulfilling as text-based knowledge. But I don't think it's that hard to go there if you think about it. Um, we still, even in text-based religions, do a lot of our religious communication and education by mouth, face-to-face, -face, in sermons and conversations and uh, lectures, because there is something that is gained hearing religious edification from another human mouth. Removing human contact from your experience of and participation in religion is difficult, as I'm sure some of you are feeling right now where we're in quarantine, in a crisis, and can't or at least shouldn't be spending time physically with our religious communities. That's hard because human contact is an important part of how we experience the divine if we're the kind of person who experiences the divine. So not only is that understandable for the Druids, but it's not necessarily a tactical misjudgment. Now, we don't know a lot of specifics about how first century Druids worked because 
texts can survive when you are the victim of genocide. Texts also help your religion to survive periods of um, elimination and oppression. Texts are a great save point, but texts leave information out, and that can also mean that when more people rediscover your texts and re-encounter, they're not necessarily doing what you did back before the thing happened. Um, we don't have Druid texts, but what we do have are folk traditions. Although the Druids themselves were one of the few religions that Rome systematically eliminated. Um, there are three that I'm aware of off the top of my head. The first is the religion of Carthage, the worship of Baal, Haman, and Tanit. The second are the Druids. One of the reasons why the Druids were a target is, as Caesar points out, Northern Europe was not a political unity. They were frequently at war with each other, but the one thing that connected everyone was the Druids. The Druids could pass from one political faction to another, they could share information, they could galvanize resistance, they could create these pockets that could modularly resist Rome. Part of what Caesar's fighting in Gaul is not just a war of conquest, but then an insurgency. Just because you've conquered a place once doesn't mean it stays conquered. And a great way to organize a resistance is through a religious network that exists independent of the political structure. So in order to conquer Northern Europe, Caesar knows that he has to take out the Druids. And the Druids have an advantage because they're based out of Britain, which is an island separated from the mainland of what is now France. This is probably why, before Rome starts making serious attempts at conquering parts of what's now Germany, they first go for Britain. They need to get the Druids. Once the Druids are taken out, then Rome has a real chance at maintaining its hold over Northern Europe and all of the mineral wealth and resources that involves. And they manage it. Uh, eventually, the last of the Druids make a stand on the Isle of Anglesey in what's now Wales. They, they're they all killed off systematically. But what's interesting is that as Druidism gives way to uh, Roman forms pasted over local gods and goddesses, and then that gives away to Christianity as practiced in the late Roman Empire, in Britain and France and Spain and parts of Western Germany, you still see customs that harken back to the kind of things we saw from the Druids, where human figures are sacrificed in effigy, where swords are deposited in water. Eventually, Christian monasteries start popping up near bodies of water. In some places in England, they're like denser than one monastery per mile, which is a ludicrous number of monasteries, but in areas with a lot of bodies of water, in order to make it acceptable to worship at this place where people were still quietly worshiping, you put a monastery over it and you can continue the, the practices of your Druid faith while also paying homage to Christian belief. And this isn't necessarily incompatible, although so, some Christians do believe that this is not acceptable. This is a real split in the fan base. It's one I'm not going to weigh in too much here. I don't think that's helpful. What I can say is that because this is an orally transmitted religion, it's both easier and harder to kill. You can kill all of the people who have memorized the knowledge, but you can't kill the practices, you can't kill the rituals, and the rituals don't necessarily have to be a certain way to honor the spirit of the ritual. They can change, they can evolve, they can blend with other religious traditions and forms, and that's how they survive. So in a way, the Druids do manage to make their mark on the modern world.
well enough that you know, they, they're still a viable, revived religion in the modern world. And they're also a part of the cultural life of Wales, too. Every year there's a, a bardic celebration called the Eistafal, where bards from all over Wales gather and compete to uh, find the best bard. And then you get to be the uh, is it archbard, archdruid. I think it might be archdruid. So at any rate, revival movements exist. Living traditions exist. Uh, parts of this survive, as I imagine some forms of the worship of Baal and Tanit survive, and certainly Christianity managed to do okay. So, in a sense, Rome didn't get everything they asked for, and that's one of the things that is somewhat warm and fuzzy about what comes next. A brief shout out to Caesar's 13th Legion. So the Legio 13, the Gamina, uh, Gamina for the Gemini, the sacred twins, Castor and Pollux, was a legion recruited by Caesar, loyal to Caesar, and eventually this is the legion that Caesar takes with him into civil war when he returns to Rome. Because not everybody is won over by Caesar's war diaries. Some people remember what Caesar did the last time he was in town. They are super horked off that he's continued to evade justice for the past now decade, because Caesar ends up doing this for 10 years, from uh, the end of 6059 into uh, the year 4948. 49 BCE is when this officially becomes a civil war. Caesar is ordered to disband his legion, go home, become a private citizen, and he knows the minute that happens, he's going to get sued. So he has a choice to make as he's coming home from Gaul with his victorious, now very wealthy, uh, battle-hardened battle legions. He can disband them and face his upcoming dismemberment in front of the entire Roman world, or he can refuse to follow the Senate's orders. He can defy them. He can keep his legion together. And he, like Sulla before him, can march into the city of Rome, take it over, and impose his will on the state. Guess which one he chooses. Now, while all of this is going on, the first triumvirate rapidly becomes unstable. At the five-year mark, there's a conference in the city of Lucca that's brokered partially by Cicero that gets Crassus and Pompey and Caesar to talk through their differences and agree to continue to cooperate. But it almost falls apart because Pompey is not an idiot. Yeah, he did a lot of what Caesar is currently doing in the 50s. And he sees that Caesar now has the possibility of becoming even more popular than Pompey is. And it's been a long time since Pompey won a war. You're only as good as your last war, and Pompey's really feeling that. Crassus never liked Pompey, and he's not Caesar's biggest fan either. He's super resentful that he's the only one that hasn't gotten to conquer a province at this point. And that's partly what ends up getting him killed in Parthia. So in 50, 56, the triumvirate gets together at this unofficial meeting. They talk through their differences, and this is, this is the point at which uh, the marriage alliance with Julia is formed. But between 55 and 52, this last five-year period, the end of the decade, Julia dies. Crassus dies in Parthia. And then Vercingetorix, who is the leader of the insurgency in Gaul, is defeated by Caesar. He can't unite Gaul. Gaul falls. Caesar has now conquered this massive chunk of Northern Europe, uniting Roman territory in Spain with the Italian Alps, creating an entire Western Europe that's Rome up to the um, Rhine River Valley. Caesar, though, has run out of war. He's, there's no more Gaul. He tried to invade Britain. It didn't go well. He kind of declared victory and left, which is, not victory. Sorry, no. 
In 49, as I said earlier, Caesar has to make a choice and he decides to march on Rome. The Rubicon River, which has silted in, we don't know where it is anymore, we have some guesses, a little south of the Po, was the last stop point that Caesar had to disband his army. If he crossed with his army, then he was effectively declaring civil war. He does it. And the Senate puts together this committee to lead the resistance, and then they nominate Pompey as the leader. And at this point, a questionable decision is made. Pompey decides that in order to avoid fighting in the streets of Rome, and in some ways I really admire Pompey for this call, he's trying to save lives, and Lord love him, I don't think he gets enough credit for this. He says, okay, you know what we should do? Let's take the treasury. Let's let Caesar have Rome. Just let him march in, let him take it. But then Caesar has to run Rome without the treasury. And remember, Rome isn't producing enough grain locally. Rome needs that treasury or people are going to start to starve. If Caesar can't pay the bills and he's left holding the bag that is governing the city of Rome, his popularity is going to go up in flames. So Pompey's plan is not bad. It's a tactically sound. The man's not an idiot. Caesar's just super lucky for a lot of reasons. Uh, that treasury gets waylaid. Caesar's men get a hold of it. They yank it. Caesar's got a budget now. And at this point, it's just all downhill for Pompey. Poor Pompey. Uh, Caesar's soundbite when he crosses the Rubicon. Here's our best guess location of the Rubicon is um, the dice have been rolled. Alia is the Latin word for dice. Yocto, yoctare is to toss. So he's, and he's not, it's not so much a badass brag. It's like, well, the dice are out of my hands. Now they're going to fall where they're going to fall. It's just YOLO is, is the point of this quote. It's an admission of just how nuts this thing is that Caesar is doing. It's pretty rational. Tactically, it's really super risky, but Caesar has very little to lose, and he realizes that Pompey, Pompey's got a lot, as does the Senate. And the minute they leave Rome, they've lost a lot of political capital. Now, what the Senate is relying on is that their allies, all of these friendly kings, these provincial relationships they've cultivated over the years are going to come to their aid. And some of them do. They assume they're going to be able to recruit people to push back against Caesar. And it's not, it's not a silly hope. A lot of the Eastern Mediterranean particularly has been watching Caesar roll over other people's territory for the past couple of years with great trepidation. Remember, Gaul may look like it's not connected to the rest of the Mediterranean much, but Gauls have been allied with Carthage. They've been allied with Pyrrhus. They have allies in the Greek-speaking world. They have relatives in Galatia and Turkey. They are just as well connected as any other ethnic group in the ancient world. And the international community has been watching Caesar with concern. Now, it's been a while since the last time Pompey conquered any of them personally, so they very well could be willing to back Pompey in a Pompey v. Caesar campaign. So again, this could have gone any way. This isn't stupid on the Senate's part. However, Caesar makes it work. He one by one defeats all of the battles that the Senate engages him in through a combination of luck and skill. He chips away at the opposition, but then he also does something clever or foolish, depending on how you want to see this. He thinks that Sulla's mistake was that Sulla was way too willing to kill off a bunch of his enemies. So he thinks a better way is to give people what he calls Caesar's mercy. This is a one-time pass where if they surrender to Caesar, he will embrace them as friends and fellow Romans. He will take them back into the fold. He'll give them political positions. This is your last chance to join Team Caesar. For now, it works. One by one, 
members of the senatorial class who have joined Pompey start surrendering. They take Caesar's mercy, they go back to the city of Rome, and they start working for Caesar, including a fellow named uh, Brutus. You'll be hearing about him in a bit. Cassius, also Cicero. Cicero does this. There are only a few holdouts. Now, Pompey, when he's defeated in 48 at the Battle of Pharsalus, he's not going to surrender to Caesar, although Caesar badly wants him to, because if Caesar can get Pompey to take Caesar's mercy, then Caesar's political victory is absolutely complete here. Pompey, on the other hand, plays his last card left because he has friends in the Eastern Mediterranean in Egypt, Alexandria, Egypt. Ptolemy Aletes is dead, but his children are now in charge of the country. I say children, they're in the middle of a civil war. The sister Cleopatra VII and her spouse and brother Ptolemy the uh, 13th are in the middle of a civil war. Ptolemy has driven Cleopatra into the desert. He's holding Alexandria when Pompey shows up. Ptolemy, with the help of his advisors, uh, Ptolemy is like 13, 14, 15. He, he's just a kid. Uh, he might have been perfectly nice, but Victor's wrote the history and he comes off looking a little bit like Joffrey Baratheon here. He sees Pompey and he makes a political calculation that if he turns on Pompey, Caesar will likely thank him, right? Because I think being himself in the middle of the civil a civil war, he's thinking, you know what I'd really like is my sister's head on a platter. So you know what? I'm going to give Caesar his enemy's head on a platter. So Pompey lands on the beach. He's given a warm welcome. He's among friends, right? He's a patron visiting his clients. His clients chop his head off and put it... Sorry. <coughs> They put his head in a preservation jar and they leave his decapitated body on the beach. His wife and his children are in a boat offshore and they see this happen, which is how the news gets back to Caesar. When Caesar lands in Alexandria, he is pissed because he needs Pompey alive. He can't forgive Pompey's head, yes? Pompey's head in a jar isn't going to take Caesar's mercy and then continue to support Caesar's future pro political career. Also, Pompey's head has been put in a jar by his clients, and uh, Romans have kind of a, if you'll forgive the sexist expression, a bit of a bros before hoes approach to foreign policy. Even if they're in the middle of a civil war, if you turn on your Roman patron, Rome is not going to take this well. So Caesar decides to make a point of this. He turns on Ptolemy. He says, look, I don't care if he was my political enemy. You cannot assassinate my bro Pompey. He's your Roman patron, and that's not okay. Gosh darn it. Meanwhile, the other party in this ongoing Egyptian civil war, Cleopatra VII, manages to get herself snuck into the city. She meets with Caesar. They make an alliance. Eventually, they end up at least Egyptian married to each other. And Caesar has this perfect opportunity to gain a friendly person in charge of Egypt. Uh, Cleopatra is also much more competent than her brother. She speaks seven languages. She's really well liked in the international community. Uh, she's a political powerhouse. In many ways, Caesar and Cleopatra are just made for each other. Full disclosure, I kind of ship them a little bit. I think it makes sense. <sighs> You've probably heard about Cleopatra VII if you've heard anything that she's sexy. That's missing the point. That's missing all of the points. Um, interestingly, our earliest and best source about her said that you know physically she wasn't pretty, but she was really smart and she was incredibly charming. And this combination of competence and intelligence and social skills made her just 
irresistible in any kind of a negotiation situation. And that's what later sources interpreted as, oh my god, sexy and pretty. Which is just irritating to me on so many levels. Cleopatra VII was a freaking genius. The point here, though, is that Caesar hasn't actually conquered Egypt, but what he's done is he's put a friendly queen in charge of Alexandria, the grain basket of the Mediterranean. He has permanently solved the grain situation. So he's conquered Gaul. He's won the civil war in Egypt. He's also conquered sundry territories in Asia Minor on his way there, because why not? This makes him as successful, if not more successful, than Pompey. He's fabulously wealthy. Crassus is dead. Caesar no longer owes the bank any money. He got everything he wanted, and he's going to continue to do that for a while. This brings us into the final years of Caesar, where, um, indeed, much like a boss, he wins until he doesn't. So the years 48 to 42 are longer than they look, because one of the first things Caesar does when he returns and he's named dictator, at first he's just a regular dictator. He, uh, Marcus Antonius, by the way, is his military lieutenant and becomes his number two man in Rome. He decides that it's time to make some reforms. He takes the right lesson from Sulla, that one of the things you should do when you're in charge is you should fix all of the irritating, inefficient shit that bothered you when you couldn't do anything about it. I find this very relatable. So he decides to fix the calendar. He notices, like many people at this point, that it's getting increasingly silly that every time the calendar gets behind because 365 days doesn't quite line up with the length of a year, that we have to like stop and add some extra days to the month of February or like add an extra month that's sometimes there and sometimes not. It's horrible for your record keeping. It's really messy. So Julius Caesar rewrites the calendar. But in order to fix it, it's been so long since they had an intercalary month that the year 47, or rather, sorry, I think it's the year 46. The year 46 is like a month and a half extra long in order to get the calendar back on track. Uh, yeah, it is the year 46 because he's abroad in 48 and 47, continuing to defeat people, including... Uh, the Battle of Zela, which is where the, the quote, I came, I saw, I conquered, came from. It's the most rememberable thing about that, unless you're from there. Finally, in 46, he defeats the last couple holdouts from the senatorial... Oh, damn it. Sorry. Um, my cat touched the mouse pad and advanced the slide, and I can't go back to record it, so let's hope I remember all of this. The last two holdouts, uh, Cato the Younger and uh, Metellus Scipio, I think, one of the Scipios, refuse to surrender to Caesar. They end up taking their own lives rather than accept Caesar's mercy, which irritates Caesar, but that's that. Uh, Caesar then goes a little too far. Maybe he's been winning for too long. Maybe he forgets that some people might still have a grudge against him. He declares, gets himself voted dictator for life, thinking this is completely different from a king. Totally not the same. Nobody will get offended. Ah. But a lot of the people who accepted Caesar's mercy that one time have been stewing for the past couple of years, including a guy named Cassius Longinus, who recruits Marcus Junius Brutus to be his uh, ally in a conspiracy of a lot of people, many of whom Caesar pardoned in the last civil war, they get together and in 44 BCE, on the Ides of March, March 15th, they stab Caesar to death in, ironically, Pompey's theater. Remember that theater that Pompey built? Caesar ends up dying in the public monument to his dead political rival. They planned it that way. It's, it's part of the thing. Marcus Antonius, though, wins from the assassins the right to give Caesar's funeral oration. 
this is a religious custom that's considered an important courtesy. The assassins make a political decision that they're going to take some of the mercy out of Caesar's book. They're not going to kill all of Caesar's allies. They're just going to kill Caesar and then call it good and assume that this will fix everything. Marcus Antonius, however, has been playing sick and fiddle to Caesar for a while. He sees his opportunity. And when he makes his funeral speech to Caesar, uh, he holds up, he reads Caesar's will in which Caesar left every Roman citizen some money, and then he waxes eloquent about how um, you know, Caesar was always thinking of the Roman people, but all oh, these people murdered Caesar. I mean, I guess he had it coming, but gosh, Caesar gave you money. Wasn't he awesome? And like, remember Gaul? We've got a shiny new province. Like, aren't you better off than you were 10 years ago? Don't you feel sad about Caesar? The crowd goes nuts. There is an uprising. Caesar's funeral pyre is burned in downtown Rome in the Forum, and it is no longer safe for the assassins to remain in the city. They cut a deal with Antonius where they will go to be governors outside of the city of Rome, and Antonius will pinky promise not to kill them. This doesn't work out. Now, at this point, we get to the second triumvirate, and here I'm going to be very selective about the story I tell you, both because this is already a monster lecture, I'm so sorry, guys, and there are a lot of moving parts here. The story I'm telling is the story that gets us to Octavian, who is going to succeed where Caesar failed in turning Rome from a representative republic into an effective autocracy. Now, this is the same family tree from before, but with our new players here. Uh, Crassus is gone. He's irrelevant. There's gold in his face and his skulls in Parthia somewhere. Antonius forms an alliance with Cleopatra VII, um, Caesar's ex-widow something, Queen of Egypt, that Cleopatra. They end up having three children together by the end of this. Simultaneously, though, originally he's married to a woman named Fulvia, who is a total badass, and it's unfortunate we don't have a lot of time for her here, but Google her, she's fantastic. His, when Fulvia dies, he makes a political marriage with Caesar's heir's sister, because Although Antonius wants to inherit all of Caesar's power, he's in a bit of a bind because he is not Caesar's legal heir. He himself cannot disperse the funds that are in Caesar's will. He has to leave that to Caesar's nephew, this teenage dude, I think he was like 17, 18 when Caesar dies, and that is Gaius Octavius. This is Caesar's grandnephew. So Caesar's sister had a daughter who had a kid with a guy named Gaius Octavius. This is the, you saw his ancestor in the Tiberius Gracchus movie. It's a few generations later. When Caesar adopts his nep grandnephew in his will, he becomes Gaius Julius Caesar Octavianus, because that's how adoptive names work, right? You take your original name and put anus on the end of it. He was called Octavian, but he preferred to be called Caesar, and he'd get kind of irritated if you used his birth name and not his adopted name. Confusingly, this means that a lot of historians won't tell you which Caesar they're talking about. They'll just say Caesar, and you have to be like, oh god, is that like Julius Caesar, or is that Caesar Octavian? Welcome to my personal hell. Uh, sometimes historians don't even know ourselves. But at any rate, when he's adopted in Caesar's will, Octavian becomes Octavian, from Octavius to Octavian. At the end of the civil war we're about to talk about, he ends up with the name Augustus as a, an extra cognomen. That story is for another slide, but I'll get us there eventually. Now, he and Marcus Antonius have to get along. 
in order to capitalize on the political upside to Caesar getting assassinated, they need each other, but they hate each other so much. Antonius hates that this teenager looks into political power just because he's related to Julius Caesar. Antonius actually worked for Caesar, right? He's he's done his time. He's paid his dues. It's his turn, damn it. But Octavian is not about to let this opportunity go. He is a social genius. Not great militarily. Uh, he had some chronic illnesses that made it difficult for him to be like his uncle was as a warrior on the battlefield. As a military commander, he had a a bro named Marcus Agrippa, who did a lot of his work for him. He took a lot of the credit, but his rivals were keen to point out that without Agrippa, Octavian's military successes wouldn't have been successes. In order to make this relationship functional, Antonius married Octavian's sister, Octavia. At the same time, he was Egyptian married to Cleopatra and having babies with both women at the same time. If you think this led to tension, you're right, it did. Uh, Octavian was super horked off that Antonius was cheating on his sister. Antonius thought that Octavian was a complete dick and he didn't want to deal with him. Octavia, to her credit, and she doesn't get nearly enough, we tend to focus on her brother a lot, but she was a linchpin in her brother's political future and also one of the reasons why in 44 BCE there isn't an immediate civil war. For about 15 years, like almost two decades, from 44 BCE down to the Battle of Actium in 31 BCE, Octavia manages with variable success to keep Octavian and Antonius from killing each other. There are these flashpoints of brief civil wars and then they make up and then it's okay for a while and then there's another civil war and then they make up and eventually it just devolves. But she tried, gosh darn it. The stability of Octavian's political future is due not in small part to Octavia's cooperation and help. She was a major patron of the arts. She helped Octavian with the business of running Rome day to day. And in collaboration with Octavian's wife, uh, Livia, she was one of the most powerful people in the Western world. She's one of the first women to get her face on coinage, Fulvia is the first Roman woman living to get her face on coinage. Octavia eventually gets it, Livia gets it. This is a period where royal women come into their own. And even Cleopatra VII, although this doesn't end well for her, she manages in her last days, she was in her 40s, when finally Antonius is defeated. She was the only he was the only person she could side with in this Roman civil war. He was in charge of the Eastern Mediterranean, so she had to work with him. He loses, and she tries to make an alliance with Augustus, but then she realizes that he has no intention of that alliance. He wants to put her in a triumph. She takes her own life. Egypt becomes a Roman possession, but she tries until the absolute last to do what she can to resist Rome, and she's the last man standing in the East, which is the thing we should be remembering about her, is in, the, in terms of resisting the Roman juggernaut, Cleopatra VII is the all-time trophy winner, maybe even arguably above Mithridates. They're at least in the same category. And yet, She's a sexy Halloween costume. I cannot tell you how pissed this makes me, folks. Oh, yes, it makes my cat upset too. You wouldn't want to upset this tabby. She's so cute. Now, briefly, oh God, I'm gonna try to be brief. I'm so sorry. Uh, the second triumvirate forms as a response to the assassination of Caesar. And I've already talked a lot about the 
two core parties here, Octavian and Antonius. Uh, Brutus and Cassius are the ringleaders of the assassins. They're defeated at Philippi. The second triumvirate, unlike the first triumvirate, though, this is an official thing. The Senate ratifies it. They recognize it. It's out in the open. This isn't an unofficial cabal like Caesar, Crassus, and uh, what's his face? Pompey were. Oh, sorry, Pompey. This doesn't make it any more stable. It's not. Octavian and Antonius hate each other. Lepidus is meant to be the stabilizing force. Lepidus also ends up getting the short end of every stick. And isn't this the way? Whenever you've got three people, one of them is going to be the awkward, short-changed person. Although maybe not. If you've made a threesome work, that's difficult, but I'm sure possible. This, however, is not a healthy functional relationship. Lepidus, at one point, tries to secede from the triumvirate. He's given North Africa, not all of North Africa, just North Africa up to the edge of Egyptian territory. Effectively, it's more complicated than that, but let's go with that. If this sounds a little bit uh, lacking to you, it did to Lepidus as well. So he tries to strike out on his own. He loses, but he actually lives. I think he, he lives at Antonius, certainly. Uh, he retires to his country estate and writes poetry, and he's fine. Good job, Lepidus. Now, the other thing that the second triumvirate does is they decide that Caesar's mercy was a mistake. They're not going to do that. Now, part of why Caesar went for Caesar's mercy is that people were still thinking about Sulla, yeah? Caesar wanted to make sure people understood that he's not like Sulla. He's not like the other dictators. He's a nice dictator. He's an awesome dictator. He's a beloved dictator. He's, he's great. It doesn't work. And the second triumvirate takes a note from that. They decide, you know what? We're not doing the mercy thing. Mercy? is for suckers. You know what we're going to do is we're going to bring back the prescription list. Great idea, Sulla. So this is now, the last prescription was in 81 BCE, 44 BCE, we're four decades later-ish, not even four, like this is 30-ish years. So people who were old enough to remember the Sullen prescriptions are going to be um, older people now, and they're 60s, 70s. So some people would have lived through both of these. And that was just as traumatic as it sounds. Antonius, Lepidus, and Octavian, mostly um, Octavian and Antonius, write up their list of people they hate the most, comprised of their most vocal opposition, including Cicero. Cicero is killed in this particular prescription. Somebody comes to his house, he's not only decapitated, but his hands are chopped off too, and then his defaced hands and body are nailed to the Senate door. Or not the Senate door, because the Senate's burned down, but they're nailed, I think, to the rostrum. That's right, the, the rostra, the speaker's platform. It's, it's a sad ending for Cicero. He's a problematic figure, but I don't think anybody deserves that. He's not the only one, though, and they don't stop just at people who are political enemies. You see, by now, the budget is running really low. They haven't had any massive territorial acquisitions lately. I mean, the, Egypt isn't fully Roman yet in 44, not until the early 20s can Egypt be said to be um, a Roman province that can be leveraged to balance the budget. And civil wars are freaking expensive. Rome is out of legions, they're out of men, they're out of politicians, and so their solution to this is an equally unsustainable but uh, classic one. That is, they put people on the prescription list who have a lot of money because when you're on the list, your property is confiscated by the state. So your life is forfeit and your stuff now belongs to the government. So this is like if, say, we decided to settle all of the national debt by declaring the entire 1% to be enemies of the state, and then we 
just gave people the legal right to march up to them, decapitate them, and turn in their head for a bounty. And this is the one thing that I want you to keep in your mind as you go to read the race guest die. Now, this is not for the midterm. This is looking ahead now. But when we talk about the age of Augustus, I'm having you read two documents, the Reis Gestae and Virgil's Aeneid. The Reis Gestae is an inscription that the now Emperor Augustus had carved up to be his um, resume, his explanation of why he was the GOAT and why he deserved to be called Augustus, which means like the revered one, the respected and the Senate gives him this as a nickname, and then he goes with it in uh, 28, when Antonius is finally defeated. Now, behind the race guest eye, he makes a really good case for himself, but you have to remember, and, and one of the things I'll be asking you to do for quiz three, is to read that imagining that you're a family member of someone who was executed in the, in the prescriptions of 44, right? Imagine if your dad, say, was a political opponent of Augustus and he was murdered and all of your property confiscated and you're now living destitute with a traitor's name in a government that's rewarding people who were on the other side, that's run by the person who ordered your father's execution. Octavian Augustus tries to push this responsibility onto Antonius a bit. Antonius becomes a scapegoat because he loses. But living memory stands as a bit of an indictment to the process that results in Augustus. Another thing that Augustus does, actually, I think I have a slide about this, so this is coming up. Just keep that in mind. So here we are looking at the emperor around, empire around 40. The early stage of the Second Triumvirate divides the empire between Western Europe, so that's um, Italy and surrounding environs, goes to Octavian future Augustus. Antonius gets the Eastern Mediterranean, Cyrenaica, Egypt, um, Galatia, Asia Minor, Greece, all of that goes to Antonius. And Antonius was like, hey, awesome, because that's the wealthy end of the empire. That's the culturally happening place. But Augustus gets to control the narrative in Rome, and that's what ends up getting Octavian. Uh, Lepidus gets Mauritania, Numidia, and the proconsul territory of Africa, Old Carthage, momentarily. Here are some portraits of Antonius, including a coin, uh, one with his name on it with a trireme, or not a trireme, I think that's a Liburnian galley. Antonius used as his bragging rights and his point of legitimacy his success as a military commander. In many ways, he's following Caesar's playbook. And had his opponent not been Octavian, who was a very socially intelligent political operator, he probably could have managed to make the uh, Caesar Sulla Marius model work for him. However, he underestimated his opponent, and he also had a problem, a problem that Caesar shared, interestingly. Um, Antonius was an alcoholic. He, and we have to be careful with this because pro-Antonius narratives don't survive Augustus well, but enough did. He was popular, he was charismatic, he was loved by the troops. However, he was cultured in a way that Romans found suspicious. He liked Greek learning. He liked to dress up like a Greek when he was in the Eastern Mediterranean. And he also had an Egyptian girlfriend, which Octavian used to make him look like he was a traitor. Like he's not even Roman anymore. He's gone off to the Eastern Mediterranean and we couldn't even recognize him. He's got this Egyptian girlfriend. Clearly he's lost his Roman cred. 
but it's a bit of a lose-lose for Antonius, isn't it? Because if he refuses to fit in with the people he's now governing, that's a very risky and um, unfortunate way to govern a colonial possession. I don't know that there's a good way to be a colonizer, but in general, people tend to be more successful the fewer changes they try to make and the more they're willing to honor local culture and convention. A little bit about Cleopatra VII. We have several surviving portraits, and I'm giving you two of them here to give you an idea of one of the problems we have uh, as modern people commenting on Cleopatra. We don't have great physical descriptions of her. We have a good general um, description in Plutarch where he says she's not conventionally pretty, but she's super charming. We do have this bust. This is a Berlin bust. Uh, likely it's the image of Cleopatra used in one of Caesar's building programs. The temptation is to look at this and say, okay, this is what she actually looked like, and we just have to like put color onto this and we'll get Cleopatra's face. In fact, you can find people doing that on the internet. This is, however, not as good of an idea as it sounds, because keep in mind what we said with Sulla's bust, yeah? Rulers manipulate their portraits to look like what they expect, they're expected to look like. And part of what Cleopatra's doing with this portrait is she's making herself look like a mas a feminine version of a good masculine ruler, down to the, the strong nose line, um, the pronounced jaw. Her coinage makes her chin look very, very long and pointy. Um, also, the facial features and the, the way the hair is portrayed looks a lot like Mediterranean art elsewhere. This is Cleopatra as she wants her Greek-speaking subjects to look at. And remember, Greek speakers are only a small portion of the people she's ruling. She had to speak those um, extra languages, if I remember correctly. It's um, nine different, it might be seven different languages. Uh, she Harry, could speak more than I can very, very well. Uh, she was the first Ptolemy not to need an interpreter. Uh, also, another note about her, she wasn't the product of the marriage between Ptolemy XII and his sister. One of the things we tend to miss, because Ptolemies did marry their siblings, but they also had a lot of mistresses, and most people in succession weren't the union of the married sibling pair, but rather were another offspring from another person in the larger marriage. So we're talking about a polygamous situation here with Hellenistic monarchy family structures. So Cleopatra's brother was her half-brother. Her mother was um, an Egyptian priestess, and this had been going on for years. So you'll hear people say, oh, Cleopatra is Macedonian. She wasn't really Egyptian. Um, that is very full of holes. But also, Egypt was a super diverse part of the Mediterranean. The entire Mediterranean was diverse. This means that because ancient people didn't have ways of talking about blackness or whiteness, it is unrecoverable how we might read Cleopatra VII if we were to meet her today just walking around on the street, nor can we use this bus to do it. Now, there's still a little bit of paint on it, but because of artistic conventions, we can't say with any certainty that this is what she actually looked like. Uh, however, this is the most naturalistic representation of her we have, and it has a few features that are important and not necessarily common to other busts of the period. The curl bat pattern is very dense. Um, there, there's a mole that suggests that this is maybe a recognizable version of her face. She probably looked 
a lot more like Beyonce than, say, Angelina Jolie or Liz Taylor. That's where I'm going to leave that. Now, this is also complicated because we have images made of Cleopatra for the consumption of native Egyptians as well, which is what we're looking at on the right. This is her in the form of Isis, the goddess, embracing her son by Caesar, Caesarian, uh, whom Augustus had killed for dynastic reasons, which makes me so sad. Uh, he's dressed as Osiris, so when she's portraying herself to Egyptians, she makes herself look Egyptian. Uh, now, it's hard to tell because the Romans, after her defeat, went around and knocked her face off of all of her buildings. So she was deliberately erased from history, but that's also how we know this is her. Also, they did a very bad job of it, so you can still kind of see her facial features enough to tell that her image isn't consistent from one representation to another. She looks like the people she's trying to connect with and communicate with, which is what a good ancient ruler does. They can't verify your image. They don't have to watch you on the news. You make yourself look like the kind of person they want to follow. So here, here's Liz Taylor. 60s Liz Taylor is likely not our Cleopatra. But part of why you know who Cleopatra is, and I don't have to explain her too much other than to disabuse you of the notion that her entire skill set is sexy, is because her story manages to be one of the most successful stories of resistance coming out of the Mediterranean, that even with all of the sexist nonsense that accretes to it, we're still talking about her. Her contribution and personality was such that she can't be ignored. And she becomes this object of fictionalized representation and yes, fetishization too by medieval monks, um, by late antique scholiasts, by William Shakespeare when the translation of Plutarch becomes available in English. And this is one of our more recent incarnations from the um, 1960s. Here is HBO's Rome. We're a little closer here. She at least has something of a nose. But the thing that I hate so much about this show, I also love this show, but I hate it, because every time they have an opportunity to make ancient women who were actually sensible, clever, powerful, and effective look, sensible, power, and powerful, and effective, they make them look like absolute bloodthirsty loons, and it bothers the crap out of me. And nowhere is this more irritating than with Cleopatra. Like, they almost get there. Like, clearly, they knew enough to do it right and chose not to. However, Marcus Antonius, uh, Perfoy's Antonius, is my favorite screen Antonius. He is great. That's about as close as I've ever seen him to what comes out of our historical accounts. On to the last man standing. With the death of Antonius and Cleopatra, Octavian was unopposed, and with the allegiance of the army, he effectively uses martial law to create the illusion of restoring the Senate. What he claims is restoring the Republic is, in effect, he first takes direct control of the Senate. The Senate, at sword point, votes him the right to be called Father of the Fatherland and Augustus, which means respected one, honored one. In return, Augustus says, okay, I'll let you, like, have all of your constitutional powers back, and I'm going to give up all of the emergency powers you so graciously gave me because I made you. But I'm just going to keep one, just one. The one he decides to keep isn't the power of the consul. It's not imperium. Rather, the political power that Augustus realizes is the one he can use to control the state without looking like a king is the power of the tribune. He reserves the right to have his body held sacrosanct, so he's immune to getting killed. 
and he also has the power to veto. Furthermore, he retains the right to govern in the provinces. Uh, this isn't a Tribune thing, but it's something he gets the Senate to, to vote him, partially because when you have the veto, you have everything you need. The way he says it is that, look, I'm not a king. I'm not a monarch. I don't even have like a political office. I am just the the princeps, the first citizen. He also phrased it primus inter pares. I am the first among equals, which is the direct inspiration for that line from Animal Farm. All animals are equal, but some animals are more equal than other animals. This is that play. So he says, look, I'm just like any other senator except I can veto everything. And also people respect me a little extra because I have just done so much stuff for the state. Out of the goodness of my heart, I had to take over. There was a crisis. I stepped up and started a civil war. Um, and by now, Rome is tired, right? This is the end of a century of civil war. I've only covered the big ones. This is an exhausting freaking lecture, yes? Because this is an exhausting freaking century. This is why we call it the crisis of the late republic. With each step, with each exception made to get us through this temporary crisis and this friction between wealth and numbers, we come closer and closer to an autocratic system. And the last person standing, Augustus, with his wife, Livia, who was essentially his co-ruler, she had a copy of his seal, and she allowed him to be in two places at once effectively, which is why we have her portrait. There she is. Again, who knows if she actually looked like this. In fact, I try to imagine an actual human with this head, and the, the results are kind of scary. See if you can Photoshop it better, but... I, I don't think there's any saving this one. Now, with this, Augustus tries his best to put things back in order. Um, he tries to advocate for peace, for reconciliation. He encourages slash legally mandates the upper classes to start having lots and lots of babies. That law of three children comes out of Augustus's desperate attempt to refill the upper classes. Caesar also begins to allow transalpine Gauls from wealthy families places in the Senate. And Augustus continues this. So one of the exciting and less depressing things to come out of this moment is that weirdly, although the emperor spells less access to power for upper class Roman elites in the city, he creates more opportunities for power for people from the provinces. He also creates a parallel legal system that ends up eventually becoming the appeals court so that Roman citizens who find themselves in a difficult legal situation can appeal to the emperor and bypass upper class elites that way. This, for some people, means greater access to power, including a class of people coming out of the emperor's household. Because the emperor, now Augustus, isn't just one person. He's part of a familia. He has his wife, his immediate relatives, and many, many, many humans that he owns or has owned in the past and is now patron to. And these imperial freedmen become the core of the new civil service. So in many ways, the emperor's household now also becomes the machinery of the state bureaucracy, which for us feels very weird, but it almost shouldn't. We have a version of this in the White House, only without as much slavery ickiness. I've included some fan art uh, here a bit. I, it's a facile comparison, Augustus, to uh, the Soviet Union, although I also quite like this art, so it's here just because. But also, 
this is the cognitive dissonance that Rome is left with at the end of this period. Augustus is effectively gaslighting the state. He's saying, look, I'm not changing anything, okay? I'm just restoring the Republic the way it was. And a later historian, Tacitus, from about a, a century later says, like, by this point, who was left alive who actually remembered the Republic? They only were alive from, like, Sulla and beyond. By the time you get to the turn of the first century BC to CE, you'd have to be a hundred years old to have any real memory of the social wars. Nobody was alive who'd known Tiberius and Gaius Gracchus. Rome had never had a functional government in living memory. And that fragile living memory made it easy for some people and very convenient to fall into the spell where, okay, well, maybe this is the way the government should work. Yeah, I mean, Augustus is one thing that's weird and different, but there's a Senate, it's passing decrees, we're voting in assemblies, we're still electing senators. I, this is this is a republic, right? And how would you know? And people were tired. They were really tired. It's been a freaking long century. But this is how autocracy happens. This is how we lose representative governmental structures, not all overnight, but bit by bit by bit. We erode norms, we erode institutions. We tend to think that the rules on paper will save us, but it's the habits and rituals of engaging in democracy that keep democracy functional. Which is why I beg of you, Support voting rights. Voting rights are super important. Access to voting rights for everybody, guys, everybody, is really important. If you don't want your life to be at the mercy of an autocrat, you need voting rights until we come up with a better solution. And even if you like whoever's in power, you need to keep in mind that if you like your ruler now, if you create that space for an autocrat, the next guy or person is not necessarily going to be like the one you just supported. Even if you make exceptions for somebody you like, say you like their agenda, you think they're doing the right thing about foreign policy, about security, about whatever it is that you like, be very, very cautious about giving them a pass on procedure. We're about to find out why. Because the next emperor we talk about isn't going to be Tiberius, at least not for long. We're going to skip Tiberius and move right on to the third person to inherit Augustus's power. That's right, folks. We're going to talk about Caligula. But not yet! We've got to read the Aeneid first. So guys, this is the save point for the midterm. In fact, the save point for the midterm was about four slides ago. The raise gestae is after the midterm. You don't have to do raise gestae until quiz three. But uh, I hope this isn't too long. I hope this was interesting. There's another slide, so I'll just talk on the other one. Oh yeah, I was going to talk about Tiberius, wasn't I? Final thoughts. We are not done creating an autocracy with Augustus. Like, I said that this was a two century process and I meant this. This is the good news here, that even by the time of Augustus, there were still things people could do to stop and reverse the slide towards giving one person a shit ton of power just because they're related to somebody. And this happens when Augustus dies because Augustus was a one-time exception. He, the person, not the institution of emperor, was voted the right to use the word Augustus as his title. He was given um, the powers of a tribune. He was given the ability to pass vetoes. He was given all of this extra authority as like a one-time emergency deal. But when he died, it wasn't taken as a fact that whoever inherited his name and his wealth would also inherit his political position. That's not how any of this worked in Rome before, right? 
even though you may be related to a Scipio, you still had to get voted into office to get to be consul. And plenty of people who had the name didn't get the vote. Catiline. Catiline didn't get the vote. People went to civil war because they didn't get the vote. And some people who didn't have the name got the position. Cicero, Marius, Pompey. These are all people who managed to make it work. When Augustus dies, he leaves his estate and he formally adopts in his will his stepson Tiberius. So this is Livia's son from a previous marriage. He was a successful military commander and he had a long history of civil service too. Not an uncomplicated one though. He was banished at one point. He'd been married to Augustus's daughter and then it went like really badly and then Julia gets banished. There's all this drama that we're not going to spend a lot of time with. So when Tiberius was adopted in Augustus's will, the Senate had to decide, hey, do we need to give Tiberius everything Augustus had? Like, of course we'll uphold his will, but does that mean Tiberius inherits a tribune's power? Does Tiberius now have supreme command of the armies and oversight of the provinces? The Senate debates this. They think about it a long time. And then it's the Senate, who are still a representative body, yeah, due to a combination of political influence and pressure and probably fear of another crisis, because they remember the civil wars. They knew that life without Augustus could be right back into the same chaos they'd been seeing for the past three, four generations. They decide that the new rule is whoever the leader, the first among equals, adopts when he dies gets everything. Tiberius becomes the second emperor of Rome, but in some ways he's also the first. He's the first person to get to have this power because of a family inheritance. This is the next step that takes us from democracy into autocracy. Now, I've given you these two words we've talked about before, but I want to bring them up again because these are the keys of how this is sold to the Roman people. And these are the two main jobs of the princeps, the leader moving forward. That of imperator, military commander, person who ex exercises imperium, life or death, both in the judicial system and abroad in governing the provinces and border security. This is a big part of why people go for this, is they worry about border security, they worry about all these new provinces, they're worried about their empire, they're also worried about making sure that the courts run properly, they're worried about loose cannon politicians starting other civil wars. They're afraid. So they're cool with an imperator. But the deal struck here is that we don't use the word king, nor do we use dictator for life. That's too much. Caesar proved that. But what is okay is this princeps thing. This just means first, first among equals. And that's why we call this stage in the formation of empires and emperors in Rome, the principate, the rule by the first citizen. It's an intermediary step, but we're not done yet. There is one last thing Rome hasn't said yes to, and this, just for your future reference, is the last thing, the last thing that stops you from being at the mercy of a hereditary autocrat. And not just a hereditary autocrat, but an autocrat who is also a military dictator. Like, hereditary, okay, that's done. We've, we've got hereditary. <laughs> That is if the political office can survive the death of the last family member, because this is the thing about dynasties. Eventually, you run short. The problem with power is that it makes for really dysfunctional family dynamics. This family is no different. They start dropping like flies. 
Augustus loses, I think, what, four or five heirs before he finally has to deal with Tiberius. Like, Tiberius is kind of the last one he has left. And this continues to be a bit of a pattern. At one point, they pull old Uncle Claudius out from behind a curtain just because he's the only one that hasn't been caught in an assassination. It is not great to be the autocrat. And I say this to dissuade you from ever trying to be one. It may sound fun. The movies make it look super cool. You might be facing a lot of peer pressure from your generals to go be emperor. But being an emperor isn't all fun and games and hookers and blow. And if it is, you're going to get assassinated very, very quickly. <clears throat> Caligula. That is, the minute you ascend the Iron Throne of Emperorship, you've put a target on your forehead because of this last stage. That is, once the state cannot function without somebody sitting in your seat, once the military needs you there, or the political machinery needs you there to function, where it would be a huge pain in the butt to retool the Constitution to deal without you. And it is. Like, France tried this, and we end up with Napoleon. Now, they're, they're fine now for other reasons. But one of the reasons why it was a little easier to make a revolution work in America is that the king was out of state. In early Rome, kicking out the kings was difficult, and they were just a tiny city-state at that point. Once you can kill the emperor, and even if you're not related to him, get to be the emperor yourself, that's it, folks. You have created the problem that you were trying to solve by having emperors in the first place, because you have created a system that incentivizes people for starting and prosecuting civil wars. Now, it doesn't spin off the rails overnight, except for a bit of a hiccup in the year 69 CE. Uh, not for a while, but it does create instability. An instability that is part of why, even though it's really tempting to want an autocrat, yeah, autocracies are easy to understand. Uh, as social creatures, we feel like even if we have a completely inadequate leader. It's a human being. Like, we can figure out what is wrong with that person and, like, use that to get what we want out of our political system. It's super seductive because it's hard to negotiate with a system. Systems are impersonal. They're not very entertaining. Systems are boring. You have to show up to town hall meetings. Uh, you, you have to, like, campaign and pass out flyers, and it's thankless, thankless work. <laughs> But here is the thing, the, the control that you think you have by understanding the human persona of your autocrat is just that. It's an illusion. An autocrat is a scary, scary thing because humans are scary. And I include me in this. Uh, this is why I don't think Empress is ever on my CV, uh, both because I don't think I have it in me, but also... I'm not sure I trust myself with that kind of power. I've made bad calls as an instructor before. It's a tiny amount of power, and uh, yeah, sometimes you make the wrong call with even tiny power. Multiplied on a scale of millions with uh, national security hanging in the balance, like I... Even if I tried really, really hard, I think I would end up doing horrible things to people who didn't deserve it. Because humans, we can't. We just can't. We need each other. We need communities. And we all need to work. We can't just make one person do the government. We all have to do the shitty scut work of going to vote and passing out flyers and calling our friends and relatives and trying to make them see reason on the internet sometimes, or, or maybe not. Uh, I'm not going to tell you how to run your life, but it's important because bad leadership kills people. And I'm being super literal about that. And in a crisis, people are so tempted to put up with any leadership at all. 
And that's why in a crisis, it is doubly important that we stand up for human rights, we watch out for the weakest among us, and we take every step we can to ensure that our community stays safe and remains intact and has a voice and has protection and offers its protection and its power to people who society isn't paying attention to. So on that note and soapbox, I send you back into your life. I hope this was useful and distracting and not depressing. Uh, I wish you all your best from my family to yours. Take care of each other. Do what you can. Don't beat yourselves up. And know that I'm thinking of you often, fondly. If there's anything I can do to help within reason, just reach out. I don't bite, but my cat does. Yeah. Yeah.